we'll use the Christopher Taylor hammer. All right. All right. I now call the June 13th, 2019 regular meeting of the Ann Arbor Historic District Commission to order. Uh, we'll skip roll call. Do you want me just to, I'll read the intro and then we'll do roll call. I can call the roll. All right. Ten. Roll call. John Decent, yes, here. Anna Epperson, no. Devin Hall, here. Jessica Keanu, here. David Rockland, here. And Bob White, here. All right, we have a quorum. Um, introduction page. All right. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Ann Arbor Historic District Commission. I'd like to take a moment to explain the order of the meeting, specifically as it relates to the hearing of the applications. On tonight's agenda, each case will be called and we'll first hear the staff presentation and recommendations. Following this, the commissioners who served on the review committee <coughs> will present their observations and recommendations. At this point, the applicant will have an opportunity to step forward and provide any comments or additional information about the application. Once the applicant has finished, members of the public who wish to provide comments on the current case may do so, while please noting the time limit of three minutes per person. Everyone who steps forward will need to state their name aloud for the record and sign in at the sheet located at the podium and limit their comments to the application at hand. Following any public comment, the applicant may be called back to the podium to rebut any public comments and answer questions that the commission may have. Once all questions have been answered, the hearing will be closed and the commission will deliberate the application, make a motion, have discussion, and then vote. If any members of the public would like to speak to general preservation topics and not to any specific application, opportunity is provided during the public commentary following the approval of the agenda. Everyone who would like to address the commission may do so and will be asked to state their name aloud for the record and sign in at the front podium. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Your comments are valuable to the commission. I would like to now introduce the commissioners. All right, Commissioner Epperson's not here, but uh, Commissioner Hall is down there. Commissioner Keanu is right here. This is Staff Jill Thatcher. I'm John Beeson. Uh, we have Bob White right here and Commissioner Rockland down at the end. All right, and the next is approval of the agenda. Are there any additions, deletions, or changes to the agenda? We actually have one hearing that we're being tabled, right? So we're going to remove that. Or is that changing? Uh, you have to turn it we've, on. Thank you. We've, we've advertised the public hearing, so we have to open and close the public hearing in case anybody's here who wants to oh, speak okay. about it. Um, and then we'll ask for a motion to postpone it. Okay. Thank you. That's how that gets done. Okay. Um, <coughs> any other additions to relations? No. Hearing or seeing no objection, the agenda is approved as presented. All right, here we have the audience participation. Uh, do we have any members of the public who would like to come forward and speak for the record? All right. Any? Oh, there's hesitation. Ah, well you, you, you rustled, that means you <laughs> <laughs> threw you off. So, do you sign in? Yes, yes. please. please. I did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But he said he would stay anyway. Okay. Or do it anyway. That's fine. <laughs> my name is Matthew Grokoff. This is my daughter, Jane Grokoff. We live in a house over on the Old West Side uh, that is in a historic district that is not only contributing to the history of the neighborhood, but to the future of the neighborhood. Uh, and I am a historic preservationist. I think some of you guys know me. Um, I've spoken at multiple preservation conferences. I've keynoted preservation conferences. Uh, I've done webinars on historic preservation and what we can do to have both historic preservation and a tolerable planet on which to put them on. Um, so I'm here tonight specifically to talk about a project that's coming up later, but I have two girls that I have to put to bed tonight um, on uh, Doug Selby's project over on division and whether or not it is a contributing feature to the historic district. There will be other people that are coming later tonight that will speak specifically about why that, is, that should be reversed and it is not a contributing feature to the historic district. But we really have to start asking ourselves uh, during this urgent time of climate crisis, when we're making these choices, and if there is a gray line, where does that coin fall? And we are now 202 
uh, 10 years, <clears throat> 202 days, and about four and a half hours away from the year 2030, when all of the climate science tells us that we must have already reduced our emissions from today's emission rate by 60 percent. Um, we're not even close to achieving that at this point. If we don't, it triggers a cascade of events, a chain reaction of climate crisis that is irreversible. There will be nothing that we can do about it. Around the world, people are talking about our house being on fire and that we're not acting like it, and we must act like it. We are in a climate emergency. Victoria, Canada this week just declared climate, uh, climate emergency. Uh, the nation of Ireland declared climate emergency, and historic district commissions need to start acting as if we're in a climate emergency. And here's a project that is replacing a building that is not contributing with one that will contribute to the future of the historic district. Henry David Thoreau asked, what use is a fine house if we don't have a tolerable planet to put it on? And it's not something we should take lightly. Um, I believe in historic preservation. But a building like this, when we have an opportunity to really do something that is an absolute crisis, we will have no affordable housing. We will have no equity. We will have no uh, economic viability. We will have no historic districts if we don't address climate crisis. Find a way to retrofit the old buildings. Replace the ones that can be replaced and the ones that are new and infill make them in line with the Paris Accords. So I'm sure, I, I, don't, th I don't think the timer was even on, was it? Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so let's do this right. Um, for my daughter's sake, our house is on fire and we need to act like it. And so I hope you guys do too. And let Doug build this building. This is, I have no stake in that building whatsoever, by the way, other than her future. So thanks y'all. All right, thanks for everything. Thank you. Thank you. I get to go home now. <laughs> we get to have a fun night. Uh, are there any other members of the public who would like to come forward? All right, let's move on to unfinished or unfinished business. E, I don't think we have any, so we're moving on to F, hearings, F1. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion? Do, do I just jump to that? No, no, we got a little public hearing. So okay, so, so we're just open a public hearing to see if there's anybody here who'd like to speak on it. Okay. Uh, so do you, you have to give a staff report and all that? Um, I'm going to give a very abbreviated staff report, just so you guys know what's going on. This is an application at 403 West Liberty Street to modify the roof line. If you see up here this, the bump, um, some of you will recall this from a previous application last year. They wanted to get rid of the bump and um, figure out a way to cut it down. That's a headroom uh, dormer box thing for a staircase going up into the attic. Uh, it turns out that the design that got approved by the HCC doesn't work and um, the builder is coming back with a new design, um, but the owner of the property is not entirely uh, convinced that the drawings are accurate, and she also has some reservations about what was submitted. Uh, so she has asked that this be postponed to the July 11th meeting, and um, she uh, wants to review these and change the drawings and resubmit them. Um, so basically at this point, the application is incomplete, but we've ab advertised a public hearing, so if anyone would like to speak, they may, but then I would ask the commission to uh, make a motion to postpone it to July 11. Thanks. Okay. So we don't need a commissioners on the review committee. I could just skip to... No, you can just skip to... Moving right, <coughs> on to the public hearing. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any members who, uh, of the public who would like to speak on this agenda item? All right, um, now I close the public hearing portion of the application and would any commissioner like to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we uh, postpone this project 403 West Liberty, modify the roof line to next month in July. Any seconds out? Second. Second by Commissioner Rock. All right, let's move to vote. All those in favor of the Question motion? real oh. quick before we vote. Oh, I <laughs> discussion done. Well, I just, from, from Jill, isn't there, when we're postponing something, this mm -hmm. is just a chance for me to ask this question. When something gets postponed, isn't there mm -hmm. a 60 day window or something there, where there like- There is. It, that's, why we're, that's why we're postponing it to July 11. Okay. And I explained that to the owner that we need to work really quickly to get a better design in order to get it on that agenda. So if they, as long as they get it on the next meeting and then 
as long as we either decide up or down. If we don't put, we can't postpone again. Correct. Though, right? Yeah. Correct. It would be an up or down vote. Correct. At that point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other discussion on the motion? Oh. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on the motion. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. All right, the motion carries. That's wrong. No. Uh, do I need to say anything else? No. OK. Then we move on to the next item on the agenda, F2, 415 West Madison. And Ms. Thatcher. Is Mr. Berg here in the audience? All right, Mr. Berg is not here yet, so oh. I would like, like to, to skip. F3. Skip this one. Let's go to F3, and we'll come back to F2 when he arrives. F3 is 335 South 7th. All right. All right. We don't usually ever change an agenda. No, we've done it twice in one meeting. Uh, 335 South 7th Street is in the Old West Side Historic District. This is a one and a half story gable fronter that features a full width front porch with turn posts and balusters, narrow clapboards and distinctive window trim. A larger addition was built before the existence of the Old West Side Historic District. First appears in the 1894 city directory as number 33, the home of laborer Charles Markhart. Uh, it's on the east side of South 7th, one house north of West Liberty. And the applicant is seeking HTC approval to um, do a bunch of work that would normally just be a staff approval, but there was also some that triggered uh, commission review, so it's all bundled together. It's uh, replacing non-original clad windows with uh, new fiberglass clad wood windows, installing three new fiberglass clad wood windows in new openings on a modern rear addition, moving one original window opening on the south elevation approximately six feet forward to accommodate a new interior stair. Mm -hmm. So here's the front of the house. Um, I'm sure you've all seen it on South 7th Street. It's very charming. And uh, I'm going to walk you around quickly, and then I'll tell you where we're doing work. Take note of this is the big window that's proposed to be moved, um, to be moved uh, forward toward the street. Um, I think it's about six feet. Uh, the f you, can, you can see pretty clearly where the original front part of the house is. And then there's the large two-story addition on the back. That is what I've called the modern addition. There used to be a one-story wing back here. Um, I don't know if it's still under there or not, but uh, regardless, um, I, I'm considering everything behind this downspout to be the modern part of the house. That big window, uh, we noticed at the review committee that the, 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 the top, the, the, the bird beak, I think Evan called it, is, uh, which, is, uh, which is a good descriptor, is, looks like old wood. It looks like an original part, but all of this uh, trim and casing uh, and the sill uh, were replaced presumably when the, the new window was installed, this clad window was installed. So the opening is the original size and the trim may be matching the original, but it is not uh, exactly what used to be there. <clears throat> Another view of that same window, walking around uh, toward the backyard. Um, there's some window work proposed on this side that I'll show you in a minute. There's nothing proposed to happen on the back of the house. And then we have the side here. This is an addition that um, it, it juts out a little bit here past, again, we're to the little original part of the house in the front where these two windows are not proposed to be touched. There's a person door here to the left of me and you'll see some window work near that. I'm just gonna come back to these photos as necessary. Um, but the impetus for moving this one historic window uh, is that the front door doesn't open all the way right now, it runs into the stairs. Um, which has to be incredibly inconvenient for people trying to live in the house. And uh, you can see it's a very tight stairwell here, opening, entry. Um, and the proposal is to push the stairs back, make a more usable foyer here. But because the window would end up basically in the stairwell, which is not desirable, they'd like to pull it forward as, as short a distance as possible but to still get light into this foyer and, um, and not have it impede the stairs. Uh, best way to sort out this work is to just look at the elevations. Existing on the top, proposed on the bottom. Here's that existing window that would slide toward the street. And on the modern addition, they'd like to remove this window. It'll be relocated to the other side of the house, replace it with two smaller windows. Um, I believe that's to accommodate a bathroom indoors. No changes to the back elevation. And then on the north side, right now, 
historic part of the house, not proposed to be touched. But the new modern um, wing has, modern addition, has this fixed plate window, or maybe it's a casement, I'm not sure which, but it's a single pane, would be removed altogether and replaced with a picture window. Uh, this window gets slid up a little bit, and then that one from around the corner uh, gets installed here on the side. On the front of the house, uh, there's some window replacements, but no new openings. This non-original window is proposed to be replaced, and these non-original windows are proposed to be replaced with similar windows. So from the Secretary of Interior standards, the ones that best apply are number two, which says the historic character of a property will be retained and preserved. The removal of distinctive materials or alteration of features, spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize a property will be avoided. Number five says distinctive materials, features, finishes, and construction techniques are examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property will be preserved. Number nine says new additions, exterior alterations, or related new constructions shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. And from the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines for building site, recommended is identifying, retaining, and preserving buildings and their features, as well as features of the site that are important in defining its overall historic character. Um, the historic feature that we're talking about here, of course, is that one window, and the question is whether it retains that character by moving it forward. Um, I would argue that it does because uh, the window in the opening is not original. Um, most, uh, really, it's just the space where the opening is and the little um, um, bird beak up top that are uh, contributing to the historic character. And I really don't think that um, sliding that forward six feet is going to impede that, um, much worse than it's already been impeded. From the building site guidelines, it's not recommended to remove or radically change buildings and their features or site features, which are important in defining the overall historic character of the building, so that as a result, the character is diminished. For windows, it's recommended to design and install additional windows on rear or other non-character defining elevations if required by the new use, and certainly that addition is um, rear and non-character defining. Uh, from the Ann Arbor Historic District Design Guidelines, it's not appropriate to remove or radically change a window that's important in defining the overall historic character of the property. So staff does believe that the proposal meets the standards and guidelines and recommends approval of this application. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, commissioners, myself and Paul, we're on the review committee. Uh, do you want to start with the report and consideration recommendation? Pretty much anything that I would have brought up at this point. I have something for discussion, but I don't think I have anything to add to the staff report. That was pretty thorough. And yeah, I think so, too. Uh, yeah. I think the only contextual stuff that we could probably add is that the houses up and down the street are pretty similar in scale, um, mm -hmm. particularly the existing, uh, I should say, the historic resource. Um, the houses up and down the street are about the same. Many of them do have additions on the back similar to this, but uh, for the most part, they're all... They all kind of look like that. Fair. All right. Uh, would the applicant please come forward, provide your name for the record, and please sign in. And if you have anything to add to the staff report or the review committee report, please do so. My name is Jimmy Bevilacqua. I'm a lead designer of Red Metal Arc Builders, and I'm working with the homeowner on the design of the project. Um, I think that the staff report pretty much says um, what our intention was here. Uh, we certainly want to preserve the historic nature of the original part of the house, even I would say kind of the addition and how it tried, you know, in some way to match the historic <coughs> uh, reference of the, of the original home. Um, and, but we, we have a couple of things and, you know, one, there's always, you know, the, the comfort part of design, but then there's also the kind of think the necessity of design. And when, when we have a front door, which is kind of the primary means of egress uh, for a home where there's, you know, three children or two young children, soon to be three children, I think that it's important that, you know, the safety comes first and that, you know, if we can then have a, a, a sense of comfort that is um, to a space that uh, is appropriate, that we can kind of make both work. Um, you know, we, we did make some attempts at kind of coming up with a fair designs that wouldn't impede the window. Um, 
some of which were kind of problematic in other spaces um, and how like major changes would be made upstairs which we were trying to avoid um, and others which kind of you know borderlined on you know the ridiculous in some people's eyes because we were trying to create like little little wells within this wide staircase for a window to sit and not really light a space um, and I think that the window would be better served move forward lighting the hallway than it would be kind of with a little carve out within a staircase with a railing around it um, and I think that that would you know, be better the entire project would be better off for that Are the commissioners have questions for the application? Commissioner Rock? Yeah. Question, Jimmy. Yep. Um, the, how do you intend to uh, infill, so the, the sort of the window that we're talking about right now, you're, you've got the existing opening, you're proposing a, a window six feet away, um, closer to seventh. The existing opening that's going to be infilled. Can you just talk about? I I didn't see necessarily detail, or I missed it. Just explain how you're going to infill because you'll have you know you take off siding, you'll have siding, you'll take off trim. There'll be siding butted to an opening. So what's the plan? The plan is to to pull the siding and to kind of feather that siding in so that there isn't kind of the scar of the old window there. Um, certainly, you know we would be. Um, you know, we would listen to any recommendations that you would make um, if there, if you would like evidence of kind of that original opening, you know, it's something that, you know, could be arranged, you know, but our, our plan was to, to kind of pull the siding back and then kind of replace the siding in sections to match mm -hmm. the original one. Okay, so if it's wood, you'll match, it we sounds will match, like wood. We'll match the material at that point, just there's no clear break. Yes, so. of course, right, okay, thank you. That was my only question. Any other questions for the applicant? Uh, I had a similar type of question. Uh, so you'd be toothing in the siding. Um, but was there any discussion prior to you mentioning tonight with the owner perhaps of a way to um, maintain kind of the history or the evidence of that window being there, not so much a scar, but the story of that window, and then providing a new window that's compatible in the location that's desired. I, I mean, I think we, we, didn't, we didn't talk about, I think, the, the two together. We did talk about, you know, what the possibilities could be, you know, to kind of build the stair, frame the stair, and leave the window. And that's, you know, you know the, the kind of example that I mentioned before where after about two treads, you know, the treads would kick back and create like a little window well within the stairwell that would require kind of a railing around it, and that would would keep that window there. I just, I think it just got to the point where we, we felt like it was worth asking for moving that forward because I just think that the window would be better served, you know, lighting up the, the entry space, and I think that that's just um, where we fell on that. But we did not talk about adding a new window to the entry. Um, I, I was... Because it was, you know, the historic contributing part of the home, I was not looking to add any windows at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, uh, we went through kind of the scenarios of how we would keep it. And then just felt that I think we, would, we all felt that it was worth the ask of, of moving it forward and into the kind of the bigger foyer. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, moving on to the public hearing. Are there members of the public who would like to speak on this agenda? All right, and we can now close the public hearing portion <coughs> of the application, and the applicant may please be seated. Thanks, Jim. Uh, would any commissioners like to make a motion on the application? Okay. Sure. Sure. All right. I got it right here. Um, <clears throat> I move that the commission issue a certificate of appropriateness for the application at 335 South 7th Street, a contributing property in the Old West Side Historic District to replace, move, and install new windows as proposed. The work is compatible in exterior design arrangement materials in relationship to the house and the surrounding area and meets the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation and Guidelines for Rehabilitating Historic Buildings 
in particular standards 2, 5, and 9, and the guidelines for building, site, and windows, as well as the Ann Arbor Historic District design guidelines, particularly as they pertain to windows. Support. Seconded by Commissioner White. Uh, and then we move on to further discussion. Is there any further discussion? Well, I would like to clarify what Commissioner Quijano was getting at there, because I believe what you were, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were getting at not necessarily leaving that window, adding another one. You were having some sort of an indent or a, a nod to the old window correct. and then adding a new window, correct? Yes, like correct. A, and getting what a, commission is palimpsest the right word? I don't sure, know. But, but Commissioner but Rockland was saying, like how you were going to infill it. So you infill it in a way that there's a reference there to what the reference. Yeah. Yes, okay. exactly. So I think that's something that should be discussed. Um, I agree. Yeah, uh, I think there's ways to do that that would be interesting and not, and they'd still get what they want. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I. I completely agree with wanting to have a fully functioning window and providing light prior to the stairs. That makes a lot of sense. Um, but the kind of erasing of the historic window opening, um, and it's it's truly just the opening, correct? The, the window is non-original. Correct. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know. The bird's it's, beak is original. And the trim, yeah, yeah exactly. Part, part of the trim, part not the, the rest trim. of the trim. But the opening. So if there's a way to make reference uh, the original opening somehow and not just blend it in, in with the, the rest of the siding was what I was trying to get. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have a response? Or? I mean, I think it's, yeah, up for discussion, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Um, Part of that discussion will be while well, there was historically one window on that facade, now we're looking at a, you know, two openings. Yeah. Is that when you look at it, it's going to be like more of a balanced facade, and that's, that's not good. what it was historically? Is that good or bad? Or, you know, I, don't, that's a good point. I think we're getting yeah. into, yeah, I mean, we're getting into an interesting discussion, I guess, but I don't know. I, I don't have a, a definitive yeah. thing to say at it. I guess um, it, I think there are um, there are cases where we would where I would say that the standards do not allow moving a window on the side of a house. I mean, maybe we can talk about that too. And just is it appropriate to even put this uh, this new window there? Um, I think certainly if if there was like a second story and, and a window is aligned with a second story window and you're asking to move that first story window, that to me, there's like something holding that window in place on the exterior, like a good reason to keep that window there. And um, when I look at this facade, I don't yeah. see like a design reason as, you know, an exterior design reason like that would say the, the historic integrity of this home needs that window in this certain location on that side facade. Um, I would say there's also a limit probably for how close to the front of the house we would say it's okay to put a new mm -hmm. window. Um, this seems to be getting kind of close to the front, so I don't know uh, if we're passing that line either, but those are kind of the, the things that are that I'm considering. Uh, I always comments. point to the guidelines here. What's that? Yeah, yeah let's get to the guidelines. guidelines. Yeah, so uh, when I look at the, the applicable regulations <clears throat> that kind of fall into putting in a new window or taking out an old window opening and covering it over, uh, I don't see anything specific that says hey, if you cover it over, it has to show a shadow or it has to resemble it in some way. So I'm not really sure I'm buying into that one yet. Um, in terms of um, you know, um, here we have an exterior alteration, and the main point I think is is what Commissioner Rockland was really talking about, and how it's to, how it's not destroying the historic materials that characterize the property. So, if there was a window right above it that was also ornate, and the two of them were really well connected, I could see that moving a window would be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, this, to me, doesn't seem like it's affecting it all that much. Um, plus, in terms of like the location of the window. Uh, that to me also has to do as to whether or not it destroys the historic character of the property and even if they moved it all the way forward I don't think it really would because there's a window in it that 
all the way forward position on the other side of the house. Um, mm -hmm. So its character is, is, I think, if that if they move the window forward and made it much wider and different than all the other windows, then that would be a problem because it wouldn't, right. you know, would not be character defining. Um, and then, of course, all that said, we struggle with the other <coughs> regulation that says that it needs to differentiate itself. So yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> here we have a new opening where the, we typically say, okay, anytime you put in a new window, uh, we want the details of that window to be different so as to differentiate it from all the other windows. Um, so that's, that's a part that I don't have uh, an answer for yet in my head. But to me, either way, I still feel like the application follows the guidance. In my memory from the site visit was in this picture, the window would basically be where the electrical is. Is that correct? I think it was at the was it but the vent? just so was right it the of vent or left of the vent. I'm trying to remember what you said. In in the proposal, it was toward where the vent is, and we did that to keep it from the three feet from the uh, power line coming down yeah. that would That's meet the electrical yeah. building code. Um, we are looking at the possibility of moving that meter. Um, you know, let's say moving the meter three feet so that that could be centered on the window could move a little bit forward, pr pretty much centered on the meter. Yeah. That would be then in line with the uh, French doors, the kind of the historical French doors on the inside um, from the foyer. And so it's, it's just we were kind of guided by <coughs> the existing conditions at this point when we submitted. You know, we're looking into the option. Um, and I don't know if you guys can afford us the flexibility of, you know, the, the position that's shown there versus, you know, if it was kind of centered where that meter is right now. Um, you know, but it was one, we're going to have to add tempering to it. We're going to have yeah. to add like a tempering film based on where it's located here versus, you know, the other one where you have to go through the process of moving the meter to um, have it centered on the interior space. So then it kind of, it, it just reads better overall. Across the line, you're referring to Commissioner Rockman. Good question. Going up, you know, Springs as far as coming course. towards the front of the house is what. Yeah, yeah they go me. all the way to the electrical. Well, you'd have to look in the guidelines. <laughs> well, there's no guidelines. Yeah, there's no guide. yeah, right. That's really about it. It's right. No, I, character. No. character. No. And one window, I don't think would. No. If you had two windows that were close, and size, and packed in, then that would change it. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's helping that this house has one window because. If there were yeah. two windows yeah. on this yeah. facade, we'd have a lot harder time yeah. saying that because right. that, yeah. there'd be some balance to it. And right now, there's just one window on a facade, and you can basically put it anywhere, and it's as bad as it is right now, just to be blunt about yeah. it, right? Like, right. it's the window's gone. It's the opening and the bird's mouth. It's, it's not in a pristine, historic state. Did I say it right? Bird's no. beak. Yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> So that's what's there, right? So it's, I don't think um, it's exacerbating the issue. Uh, it's just keeping the issue the same, more or less. But there will have to be some skill in terms of feathering in the new yeah. siding and making it look good. But it sounds like there's, there's a plan for that. So um, I could add to the motion uh, what the request was in terms of um, the option for moving it mm -hmm. centered with the existing meter, if you want to discuss. I don't know if, how, many, how many discussions do we have going on right now? Well, we also are have we, to talk we about good? <laughs> We have to talk about some of the other windows too, but I'm, yeah. I can make a quick assumption that all of you guys can test, which is since the other windows are on the non-contributing portion of the house, we are okay with any of the windows that are being moved or relocated on that. That part of the house. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So then really going back to the motion and whether or not we need to add flexibility as to location. Right now it's drawn at 10 foot 8 from the front of the house. Doing the math quickly in my head. Mm -hmm. And as to whether or not it's okay to be located at 7 foot 2. Now I guess it would be less than that because we want to center it on the meter. Really right. it's centering on the French doors the interior, inside. Yeah. Right, which is... Yeah, just a hard thing to put in on the... <laughs> we we could have. I, I think that we were just you know, yeah. trying to get it in. I agree. It would be nicer on the French. Would be nicer. Too, but, yeah. um, so do we need to clarify that? Is that, is that something that needs to be clarified on the motion? 
Yeah, because the motion yeah. says as proposed. As yeah. proposed, so yeah. yeah. So do you want to, or are we comfortable with amending their motion to say something different? Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, something, well, someone has to do that, right? Who made that motion? I think I it was Rockland. You made the motion, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So they would have to propose that change. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll propose it, and then we can discuss. Just forgetting that stuff. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, after as proposed, we'll say, or for the um, for the proposed window on this historic south elevation, align the center of the window with the center of the existing French doors, interior interior French doors, or exterior. Electrical meter. Mm -hmm. Someone want to second that? Support. Second. Yeah. second by Commissioner White. I'm going to wait for her to read it back. So um, the work as proposed or the historic south window opening <coughs> centered on the exterior meter or interior French doors. Good. Did you hate say historic south opening or historic south win? I said historic south window opening. Okay. Yeah. South window yeah. opening. All right. Yeah. I didn't hear the window part. Okay. Okay. All right. Any final further discussion? Well, what about differentiation? You brought up differentiation, but did we, yeah. did we settle on that? I don't think we have, but um, uh, I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were. I, I didn't have a thought. I mean, okay. mostly it's like we normally re relocate a window, and when we relocate oh, right, a yeah. brand new window opening, we try and differentiate some of the window details. But the window details that are on the window aren't historic to begin with, so I feel like it, it won't matter either way. Like if we had historic casing that was on the window, we would try and differentiate it from all those. But all I these windows on the whole historic on the whole house have been revised, so. Yeah. Right, and so the materials are modern, so they're differentiated. They're differentiated in that way. already. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, and the fact that they've been changed. Okay. Yeah. So I'm okay with that. Long, That's how. Long okay. mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's vote. Or I should say, are we ready to vote? Yes. yes. All those in favor of the motion, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion carries. Your application has been approved, and you will receive written notification from staff. Please note that you must apply for any required permits from yes. the city before beginning on your project. We're going backwards now? Yep. Okay. All right, now we're going to F2. Yes. F2, okay. Back to F2. Got 415 it. West Madison. This two-story colonial revival features a hipped roof with a full-width front attic, full-width front attic gable, half-width front attic gable with corner returns and a half-round window. Wide board trim, I'm okay. street facing bay window, and a pedimented front stoop. The house first appears in the 1899 city directory as the home of Charles Herman, an upholsterer at Martin Holler Furniture, and his wife Bertha. In 1999, the HTC approved the replacement of iron front porch posts and rails with the wood ones visible today for the current owner. The turn posts are replicas of sur surviving porch posts that were located against the house wall. The property is on the south side of West Madison between 2nd and 3rd Streets, and the applicant is seeking HCC approval to add a screened-in gazebo next to an existing deck and enlarge the deck slightly. Here's the house at 415 West Madison. Um, it's a very lovely house. It's on an original <coughs> city lot, so it is uh, wider than many that you see around. It's 66 feet wide, um, and it's very deep as well. If you look closely at these photos, uh, there's an existing deck that projects off the side of the house and there's a six foot privacy screen on top of the deck. Um, here you can see it a little better. This is a, the site visit photo. Um, the proposal is to extend this deck out just a couple of feet more in this direction, and then on the back corner to add, to cut the corner of the deck, um, or rather expand the corner of the deck and place a gazebo on top of it to have a screened in room um, with, some, uh, with a new privacy wall here that would be a, a six foot fence with lattice on the top. Um, and that would circle around the back of the gazebo. Here are a couple more pictures. It's, 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 it's 
already got a very similar privacy screen um, on top of the deck. And here we are standing in the backyard looking forward. This tree is a great reference point. Um, there are a lot of black walnut trees in this mm -hmm. yard. And we heard some stories about black walnuts that make me happy. I don't have lots of black walnuts in my backyard. <laughs> Uh, if you look carefully, you can see where the stakes are. I've got a closer up photo here um, of where the, the gazebo would go. This porch, the, the, this, the, the porch stays here. I think it gets, it gets pulled a little bit closer to the tree. It gets pulled a little bit closer to the corner, but the, it still wraps around the tree. You can see it on the drawings. And here's the existing corner of the deck, and here's where the round gazebo would go up on a new foundation. Here's what the porch looks like now when you're on it. All right, so here's the side. You can see that there is a, a side door on a little bump out here um, on the wall of the house. And here's where the wood deck is. It gets expanded a little bit farther to the east and the gazebo um, goes on the rear corner. Here's that tree. It doesn't interfere with the tree and here are the steps going down. So you can see the deck also goes a little bit farther toward the back of the lot. Uh, the red areas are where a privacy fence would go in place of a traditional railing. And the blue is where a traditional railing would go. The design of the gazebo is pretty straightforward. It would sit on top of the deck. Um, this design uh, we talked about at the meeting might not have quite as much uh, trim and bric-a-brac on it. Um, and where the the guardrails have to meet code. They might have to be 36 inches tall instead of 32. Um, but um, since this isn't a historic feature, I don't think that that will be a problem. Uh, the proposed look of the, 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 the fence, the privacy screen, would be basically six foot panel fences with lattice on the top. And uh, a little drawing of where it is on the side of the house. There's the big tree. And from the Secretary of Interior Standards, number one says that the property will be used as it was historically or be given a new use that requires minimal change to its distinctive materials, features, spaces, and spatial relationships. Number two, I've read to you already. And number 10 says that new additions and adjacent or related new construction will be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property will be unimpaired. Um, I didn't mention that the gazebo is uh, 12 feet across. The height's not indicated, but it's shown uh, drawn in at just under 10 feet. Um, it is unusual for an accessory structure like this to be located in the side yard instead of the rear. Um, do I have some design guidelines for you? Yeah, here. So uh, from the Secretary of the Interior, not recommended as introducing, uh, no, 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 that's not the one I'm looking for. Here, Ann Arbor residential decks and patios. It's appropriate to install a deck that's freestanding. Uh, installing railing made of wood and using railings that have a chamfer top and bottom rail and simple square or round spindles and installing flooring made of wood or composite wood. Either of those would be fine for the deck uh, because it is not historic. It's not appropriate to install um, railings that don't meet our design guidelines, um, which is not shown on these drawings. So this one is important for the new residential accessory structures. Um, it's appropriate to retain the historic relationship between buildings, landscape features, and open space. That's one of the reasons I pointed out that this house has a very large side yard. Um, it, it proposes locating sheds and garages in the rear yard. Those are more of utility storage buildings. This is less for storage and more for um, people to hang out in. So I have less of an issue than if this were a shed that would be located in the middle of the side yard. Uh, and using exterior wall and roof materials that are compatible with historic materials on the main structure and in the neighborhood. Not appropriate is introducing new structures or site features that are out of scale with the property or the district or are otherwise inappropriate. Um, so staff does believe that it's unusual for an accessory structure to be located in the side yard instead of the rear. Um, but uh, given that there's an existing side door and deck here um, and the lot's the full 66 feet across and the work is completely reversible, um, staff does recommend approval of this motion. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner Hall, uh, would you like to do some report and recommendation? Um, the only thing that I would add <coughs> is that if you go to a, can we go to a picture Excuse of the- Excuse me, can you speak up? Yes, <coughs> just the only thing I would add from the site visit is if you- Pull your microphone closer. Sorry. Yeah. 
the only thing I would add from the <laughs> <laughs> um, can we go to a picture of the front yeah. of the house yeah please it, it, it when you're there it feels like uh, it's elevated mm -hmm. like you're looking up towards this I, I just want to that's a, one clarification when you're standing there there is a sense of that on the sidewalk on the sidewalk looking yeah. at the front so as you look at this new structure if it was to be built you'd sort of be looking up yeah this Google yeah. Street View is you know taken up on top of a car so standing on the sidewalk yep. it, it's definitively upward yeah well there's a substantial rise mm. from from you know in the ground from the yep Ralph from, from hold on we'll get there we got to go through our procedure sorry yes <laughs> <laughs> all right um, anything else we need to add on that I the, the lot is pretty deep. The, the tree is pretty big. Um, the fencing, I think it's worth noting again uh, that the height of the existing s privacy screen is exactly the same height as the new and proposed. So that's important to know that when you're looking at the photos. And there was severe damage that was pointed out to us by the homeowner from the walnuts so that the, the need for a roof on this structure to protect themselves, the grandchildren, etc. All right. Um, here we go. Would the applicant please come forward, provide your name for the record, and please sign in. And if you have anything to add to the staff report or the review committee report, please do so. Okay. Um, do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, there were a couple, as I was watching the presentation, when they showed the picture of the fence, in fact, that was just to show, you know, the design of being solid and up. But in fact, I have it's going to be all cedar to match the uh, you know the structure. So that's all you know. It'll all be um, and and of course they it'll also it'll look very much as it did before because it's going to have uh, the vine will the grapevine will still be growing and covering it. Um. Okay. Any questions from the commissioners? All right, no questions. Uh, let's go to uh, public hearing. Are there members of the public who would like to speak on this agenda item? All right, we'll close the public hearing and the applicant may please be seated. Sit down. Uh, would any commissioners like to make a motion on the application? Sure. All right, Commissioner <coughs> Hall. I move that the commission issue a certificate of appropriateness for the application at 415 West Madison, a contributing property in the Old West Side Historic District, to expand a deck and construct a gazebo in the proposed design, on the condition that they are constructed of wood. As conditioned, the work is compatible in exterior design arrangement materials in relationship to the house and the surrounding area, and meets the City of Ann Arbor Historic District Design Guidelines for residential patios and decks and residential accessory structures and the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation and Guidelines for Rehabilitating Historic Buildings. In particular, Standards 1, 2, and 10 and the, design, and the Guidelines for dis District or Neighborhood Setting. Support. Seconded by Commissioner White. Is there any discussion on the motion? I have some quick questions um, for the motion. Uh, the motion doesn't mention the hot tub, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't think can be made of wood. But is the hot tub sure. part of this? The hot, tub's, the hot tub's basically furniture in my mind. Mm. Oh, so you know, it goes on top like of the deck. A, yeah. It's not built into the... Uh, you might want to clarify that. Oh. Yeah, the hot tub, they're saying. The hot tub... Can you um, come up to the mic or I'll repeat? Yeah. <laughs> The hot tub will be partially recessed into the deck. It'll be just uh, eight inches above the uh, deck. Okay. So it would be mm -hmm. kind of built in. Okay. So it's going to sit on its own foundation. All right. And then did you guys state your name aloud for the record as well? We need to hear your names on the mic. My name is Linda Yelisich. Um, Rolf Berg. Okay. And you got both names in? Yes. Great. Oh, you get your name. Um, all right. Any other? Discussion items, any quick questions? So do we need to add anything so on the hot tub? I don't know if we need to add anything. You can sit if you want. I don't, it says I don't the think so. deck and gazebo of wood. Right. I don't think I'm it's okay. There's nothing the about the hot tub, tub so okay. it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess the only other question I had, too, was uh, um, 
they're skirting around the front of the deck down below the surface. So that would cover any mechanical systems potentially that would be exposed as well as the, the tank of the mm -hmm. hot tub, presumably. Is that in the design? It's not in the design per se, but uh, I, I expect that there is a skirt because there's a skirt there now. There's a skirt? There's a skirt, yeah. Confirmed by the owner. Well, this, this shows a skirt. The yeah. elevation? Oh, yeah. yeah, the elevation has a skirt. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a question, John, sir. Go ahead, yes. Uh, right now, the lattice has some percentage. It's not 100% opaque. It's uh, less than 50, maybe, but there's some opacity. And I guess my there's some transparency. I'm just wondering. I. I I think that the f cedar fence is an upgrade from this lattice, but I guess my question is in terms of this being perceived as a fence, because it will look mm. kind of like a fence, is the opacity level appropriate for the neighborhood and the, the, the setback within the neighborhood? Um, I think it's past 25 feet. It looks like it's maybe there's a site plan it was very hard to read, but maybe it was 20 something that looked. It's 21 to the front face oh, of the 21. house. Oh, 21. And then yeah. another 12 feet back. Yeah, so I mean, I would say most no. fences that are that opaque, we don't, shouldn't they be 25 feet back? And are we, are we um, just aware of that? And what, how do we talk about this in terms of not being a fence or being a fence? It's a little bit forward of where that opacity of fence would be allowed, however, um, this isn't really a fence. It's not regulated as a fence, at least. It's not permitted as a fence because it's attached to the deck structure. Yeah. It's part of the deck. Right. Um, it's more like an unusual deck guardrail. Uh, so, yes, so, yes, okay. visually, visually, I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. Right. Um, but you, it doesn't have to meet the fence code as long as they get a building permit for the deck that it shows it. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Could I make uh, one, one more comment? Oh, yeah. uh, a comment regarding the fence that part of the fact here is, I'm not sure the picture uh, shows it, but the, the neighbors, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, none of this really shows. They recently put a huge addition on the back. And they are only three feet from the lot line. I mean, they grandfathered in. They wanted to make a complete. There was a, uh, a hearing on, on that. And there was a lot of concern about how, how uh, close they were and, and large they were and changed the character and such. And it's, it's a, um, a, it's a religious institution as well, and they, and they verified it. But the idea was that uh, they said, OK, we, they noticed that we'd made a lot of efforts in separating. Uh, but I think that to the extent that it's you know, greater privacy than now, it's really dictated by the fact the, of the neighbors. And the amount of side yard there is because they're so actually too close to the, uh, to the lot line. OK. Um, any other discussion? All right, so the last part I'm just going to haul out here is the Ann Arbor District design guidelines uh, appropriate saying installing a deck at the rear of the property that is sub subordinate in proportion to the building. So although um, Jill had mentioned that you know this is still a little, a little more forward than we're used to and it's on the side, but uh, by and large, it's still particularly subordinate to the historic resource. So um, particularly the scale that we even see it now in this photo, you can tell that it's not going to be much taller than this. And the gazebo part is actually going to be closer to the tree and even further back from the street. Uh, so it may not even be seen altogether. Um, so by and large, I, I feel like this meets the guidelines. Any other discussion? All right, ready to vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Uh, the motion does carry. Your application has been approved and you will receive written notification from staff. Please note that you must apply for any required permits from the city before beginning your project. All right.
one, two, F. Yep. One, two, three, four. F four. Yeah. F four. Yeah. Um, so, Commissioner oh. Commissioner Rockland has a possible conflict of interest uh, with this application, oh. and um, he is going to remove himself to the council workroom or someplace else, okay, uh, and just be absent. So um, that Someone, brings us down to four. So Bob to, just left. When Bob gets back, okay. we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> brings you down to four, so you would need three to pass a motion. Okay. Okay. And All we'll right. have to remember David too. 315 Mulholland is in the Old West Side Historic District, which is incorrect at the top of this report. It's a one and three quarter story gable fronter that first appears in the 1916 Polk City Directory as 315 6th Street, the home of J. Royal and Maud M. Sage. Royal was a carrier for the post office. 6th Street was later renamed Mulholland. House features a full width front porch, wide board trim beneath the eaves, and a small wood-sided garage that was added between 1916 and 1925. The house is on the east side of Mulholland between West Washington and West Liberty Streets, and the applicant is seeking HDC approval to raise the roof uh, on a garage 36 inches at a window in the front gable, remove a bump on the rear elevation, and replace it with a new person door and window. Here's the garage um, that we're talking about. Um, it's, it's a little bit off the house. You'll see it better in... Uh, photographs as we get closer. Still has its double leaf doors with um, eight lights on the top and three panels below, um, which makes it particularly charming. A lot of these garages did not retain their garage doors. So it, it did have a, um, a low slope shed roof. That roof is still inside and there was a photo of it in the application materials. Uh, and when you're looking at the front of this, you can see where the old siding boards end and the new ones begin. It's probably this board right about here. Um, and then they presumably just, just cut the siding off when they put the pitched roof on. And um, instead of having a parapet that would have wrapped around three sides. Um, this roof is proposed to be raised 36 inches to make a usable loft area inside. This is the side that faces uh, their yard. There's a bump on the back. This is pretty common. Um, I, I used to think that it was more special than it probably is because this was the thing where you'd, you'd build your garage for your Model T and then when the wheelbases got longer um, and you needed some place to put the hood of your new Chevy or whatever, um, they would put this bump in the back to accommodate a longer car. Um, I think that people have been doing that since cars, um, since we graduated to things other than Model Ts. If you go online, you can figure out how to do it today to your garage. <laughs> so. There's no telling if this was done in 1920 or 1990, um, but uh, the the wood is um, it, it seems it seems pretty modern. I'm I'm not really concerned about losing that feature of this building. There is a window in the gable facing the back. There's another shot of it. The other side wall has no windows. Um, here there is a photo. You can see the old roof, and you can stick your head up um, into the attic and see the old roof, it's still there, it's still got some shingles. The proposal is to increase the, the roof height 36 inches um, in order to make a usable loft. Um, remember that you saw this on the last application too, these, these monitors distort um, the proportions. It's not this tall and skinny now and it's not getting that much taller and skinnier. So you might want to look at your paper copies if in doubt, um, but the proportions are correct here. Um, uh, Let's see. So here is the, um, the side has a window, window still there, but the bump is removed. And the rear elevation, um, the, the, the car bump is proposed to be removed and a large picture window and a person door added on the back. It's on a large, a thick concrete slab to, to build up the, the, the foundation in the back. Um, so there are a couple of stairs proposed to be cut into that. This is the side facing the neighbor's house, um, which really would just have this bump removed and the roof raised up another 36 inches. The, um, this, it says that the siding and existing windows would remain and the double leaf doors would remain. There's a new wall on the interior, which behind the double leaf doors, this is the front of the building, so this would just be storage area. The rest of this would be made into habitable space, conditioned space, and you can see the line of the loft above. The reason for raising the roof would be to accommodate 
uh, somebody who can actually stand up in there, you know, get, get a seven foot roof, at least um, at the ridge. I don't know that exact uh, dimension because it wasn't provided, but um, it seems likely. Um, though you would have a roof pitch, so it would, it would pitch down pretty, pretty steeply. Um, you can see that this is just open space, uh, shelves and cabinets here, a closet here. It does not appear to be plumbed or have a bathroom or have a sink or anything like that, um, which would mean that nobody could ever sleep in it. It wouldn't be a, a, a cottage or an accessory dwelling unit per se. Um, if this, uh, if this uh, application is approved, um, it may need to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for permission to alter a non-conforming structure if this garage sits closer than three feet from the side lot line now. Um, that hasn't been confirmed because uh, um, a stake survey uh, wasn't done or a, you know, a formal survey provided. So that's just in there in case. Um, from the Secretary of Interior Standards, it says that a property will be used as it was historically or be given a new use that requires minimal change to its distinctive materials, features, spaces, and spatial relationship. So this is, where, um, this is where I take issue with this application because it really changes uh, the spatial relationship of what was a historic squatty square single car garage with a nearly flat pitched roof um, to a, uh, it's already been um, damaged historically with a gable roof, though it will prolong the, the life of the building to get snow and rain off of it. Um, but raising it up three feet is, is just um, changing the proportions such that it's no longer a little square one car garage and looks much more like a one and a half story um, uh, barn. Barn structures were often built that way um, with a first floor for animals or your buggy or your saddle or whatever and then room for hay up above. Um, and this proportion looks very much uh, like uh, what, a, a more, what many people call a carriage house um, or just a small barn um, on the old west side might look like. Standard two says the historic character will be retained and preserved. The removal of distinctive materials or alteration of features, spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize a property will be avoided. Um, so I, I do think that changing that gabled roof feature by raising it is, is um, going in the wrong direction per se. Um, new additions, uh, alterations, or new construction shall not destroy historic materials. I'm not so worried about that aspect of it because uh, the roof's already uh, been removed. If this were a parapeted um, shed roof now, uh, I don't think we'd be having this discussion because um, it, you know, it, it probably wouldn't have gotten this far. Um, the new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing size, scale, and architectural features. Um, it's tough to see any differentiation between the new and the old um, on this building as it is now or as it's proposed to be. And if undertaken, it will be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property will be unimpaired. Right now, you could do that because you know exactly how that shed roof lies inside. Um, but I don't know that you could do that once that shed roof is removed and a proper floor is put in um, and, the, and the, the walls are, are made taller. So uh, it is staff's opinion that raising the roof 36 inches changes the appearance and spatial relationships of the historic single car garage and that the work is not differentiated from the old and the integrity of the size and architectural features is compromised. Um, the remaining work is appropriate and should the owner desire to finish the interior with no loft or a low storage loft instead of one that a person can stand in. I have no issues with, um, with redoing the back um, to have a person door, have a big window, uh, even potentially putting a window in the gable in the front to get more light in. Uh, since, again, this is not an original part of the structure and there's one on the back. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's changing the proportions of the building and extruding it upwards um, that staff doesn't believe is appropriate. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner, myself, and Hall, do you want to add anything? Uh, the only thing that I would add is if we go back to a picture, maybe like a straight-on view from the front of the house, yeah, perfect. As the case is with many of the houses on the street, you know, the driveway, it, it's a clear shot straight down. It's prominent. It's not kind of hidden back there. Mm -hmm. It's it's noticeable. So the proportions would change. It would be noticeable, I guess that's what I would add. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, add to that too, saying that it is uh, um, walking down Mahone Street, I would say that the rhythm of all of those little garages in the back 
are very similar coming down. You see the house, you see the driveway, and you see the tiny little garage in the back. Yeah. And it's repeated over and over again. Uh, many of them are the parapet wall in the front. There are very few that are gabled. I didn't, I didn't notice any that were gabled. There's a couple. There's a couple. There's a couple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but they were all that very small proportion. So. Okay. All right. All right. Would the applicant please come forward, provide your name for the record, and please sign in. And if you have anything to add to the staff report or the review committee reports, please do. Sure. I'm Andrew Hersher. I own the house. I'm the architect of the proposal. Um, let's see. In terms what I would add is, let's see, a couple of things. First, um, the, the rhythm of the garages on Mulholland Street doesn't exist. That most of the garages on Mulholland Street have been destroyed without uh, this commission's approval, as far as I know, and been replaced by all sorts of structures. So there's ve actually very few garages um, on Mulholland that still retain any relationship to either the original shed roofed form or I would say the kind of garage I have, which is uh, a garage with a gable roof that was added in the 1960s and 70s. So you can't really, I would, I, would, I would sort of gently suggest you can't really preserve something that doesn't now exist. That, that original rhythm is gone. And a walk down Mulholland Street will attest to that. Um, the second thing that I would add, I think, I would, I, and, and this gets to something Jill said, is I would like to, uh, I, I think it's important to dis distinguish, um, the, the, the term old was used here as applying to both the, the, the shed roofed garage, which was built before 1945, and the gabled addition, which was built after 1945. Um, so Jill, in your remarks, you, you pointed out that um, the proposal um, doesn't differentiate, the, the new part, the proposed new part doesn't differentiate between the old part. Um, but I would argue that um, uh, um, the old part is already enmeshed with the new part. Um, you, the old part is the shed roofed garage, the new part is the gabled roof that was added. You already don't see a distinction between them. So the sort of the, the approach of the, of the proposal was to say, okay, it's already in that sort of gable roofed form, so why not um, maintain that form as, 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 as sort of as emphatically as possible while making the garage useful. Right, anything else? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, we can, uh, commissioners have any questions for the applicant? Next questions. So, are you averse to decreasing the overall height? To what? What, what heights do you? Uh, um, uh, what height? What would the reduction be? I mean, it depends on the number, because the the I, 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 the garage is, uh, for all intents and purposes, useless. Now, it can't be weatherproofed. It can't be rodent-proofed. It's too deteriorated. Um, the, and, and the interior loft is so, it's probably about four feet high, so it's, it's it, it, basically the garage is only usable as a storage space, and because it can't be weatherproofed or rodent-proofed, it can't even be used as that. So, th so it's, it's useless, and, and um, the proposal is to make it um, useful by turning it into a, a usable storage space, and in a, a habitable space, um, augmenting that. Okay. Uh, moving on to the public hearing. Or, uh, well, first, are there any other questions for the applicant? All right, and then we'll move on to the public hearing. Are there members of the public who would like to speak on this agenda item? All right. Um, I will now close the public hearing portion, and the applicant uh, can be seated. Thank you. Uh, would any commissioners like to make a motion on this application? Sure. Commissioner Hall. <coughs> I move that the commission issue a certificate of appropriateness for the application at 315 Maholland Avenue, a contributing property in the Old West Side Historic District to raise the roof 36 inches, add a window on the front gable, remove a bump on the rear elevation, and replace it with a new person door and window as proposed. The work is compatible in exterior design, arrangement, materials, and relationship to the garage and the surrounding area, and meets the Secretary of Interior standards 
for rehabilitation and guidelines for rehabilitating historic buildings, in particular standards 2, 9, and 10, and guidelines for building site and district or neighborhood setting. Support. All right. Seconded by Commissioner White. Uh, is there a discussion on the motion? I, I, I could start a little bit. Go ahead. Um, I, I would argue that the, the mere fact that there are at least more than three garages that I could count on Mulholland, particularly right when you walk off of Mulholland Street, uh, or walk onto Mulholland Street, there's one off to the left from Liberty that is of that same scale and size. Uh, and then as you go down, you, you do continue to see them of that scale and size. Um, that that is a feature. I think you actually made our argument stronger to keep it as is. Um, you, are you talking about the original Shepherd garages or the augmented gable garages? The size, it's general massing as it is right now. So gable or not, you have to come to the, the mic if you want to speak. So, so basically, what I was a little bit confused by, by your remarks was, were you referring to the original pre-1945 shed-roofed garages or the post-1945 gabled roof garages of which I have one? I would argue that both are existing on Mulholland in one form or another in terms of its overall massing, and that massing does not match any current proposed matching that you have of 11 feet tall. Okay, that's your claim, yeah. Yes, any other discussion on the motion? Uh, so I would say I take up issue with it on standards 10, new additions and adjacents or relevant new construction will be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property will be unimpaired. Um, this is proposing to re completely re remove um, the structure and replace it. Um, you, you weren't on site when we got to see it, um, so we did try to look inside. And I would say that uh, this is not a decrepit, falling down structure. It's quite intact. Um, the only thing that is deficient on it is the, the roof framing, the gable framing that was added, um, is uh, one buys. It was undersized, yeah, or seemingly undersized. undersized. Uh, you, and there's no, there was a ridge beam, but it was also undersized. The modern gable framing seemed undersized for when they, when they did the work. That's all you're saying. Um, but that the walls were still intact. There was no uh, definitive notion of uh, rotting on any of the areas <coughs> of the building that we could detect. Um, by and large, the shiplap was still intact. Um, sure, there was no sheathing. The, the shiplap was acting as sheathing. Um, but in terms of, you know, overall weatherproofing, you know, a good gable roof on the side of this, uh, which is on there now, would shed a decent amount of water. Um, the next part on the Secretary of Interior guidelines for rehabilitating historic buildings, district and neighborhood setting, uh, not recommended to introduce new construction in historic districts that is visually incompatible and that destroys the historic relationships within the setting. Uh, I would say the, the new proposal is, is, is doing just that. It's uh, visually incompatible uh, with the other structures on the street, the accessory structures. Any other discussion? Those are my opinions. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. I, I don't take any issue with putting the window on the back or any of the other work that could make the space habitable. I do take issue with the height. Okay. Any other discussion? All right, are you ready to vote? All those in favor of the motion, please say yes. All those opposed, please say no. 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 Uh, the motion does not carry. And so your application has been denied and you will receive written notification from staff. Please note that you must apply for any required permits from the city before beginning on your project. All right. Um, we're on to F5, 120 West We need to go get West Commissioner Belt. Rockland. Oh, yeah, we got to go get Commissioner Rockland. F5, 120 West Washington. <clears throat> you can just get a new one if you want. There's plenty of others. It's because they keep grabbing you. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
120 West Washington Street is um, uh, this double storefront. It's um, this is actually three different storefront addresses on this application. 118, which is the right-hand building here, 120, and 117 South Ashley around the corner, uh, which is the old German. It's an L-shaped building. This is all the same building. Um, it's just happens to have three storefronts, and it's pretty much always been that way um, on the Sanborn maps. It was constructed in 1908, and um, the original old German restaurant was present in the building from 1928, first on the South Ashley side and later uh, in, in these storefronts. There's a large fire in 1975 and as a result these front facades of these three bays were remodeled in 1976 with vertical windows replacing the double hungs and large brick and metal roofed awnings uh, above the, re the remodeled storefronts. You can see in some of these pictures, this is, this is truer uh, the upper floors to um, what the original looked like though I think that these windows have also been replaced. Uh, there's a photo in there of the downtown streetscape survey um, that shows what things looked like in 1976. And certificates of appropriateness were issued by the HDC in 1995 to renovate uh, this building uh, for the Grizzly Peak Brewing Company, which replaced the original Old German. So the applicant is seeking HDC approval to replace the three storefronts from 1976 with more sympathetic ones in proportions more typical of historic storefronts. They're not replicating anything. We don't know what these originally looked like, um, but they are uh, simplified and the proportions are more uh, historically accurate. They are brick and aluminum with transom windows and two have accordion folding display window glass. So they certainly have modern components as well. Um, Old German's a little bit different. It doesn't have the big um, display windows uh, right now. Well, actually, none of them have really big display windows, but it has a taller wall underneath the windows. Um, so here's what we looked like in 1975 and 76, um, before these two had the fire and were remodeled. Um, you can see that the storefronts there looked like they were from maybe the 30s, 40s, 50s. They've all been changed. They've all been altered. None of those are still there. So the demolition work is um, proposed uh, on to, to take off that large brick awning bump with the metal roofs, which I'm just really happy to see go. <laughs> um, it may have been really cool in 1976, but um, I'm, 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 I'm happy to see these storefronts go back to something that's uh, more typical proportions. Um, more, that's the demo on the Ashley side. Here's what Ashley would look like. It has these accordion windows, a little bit um, lower knee wall than what is there now. Uh, two person doors, one to go upstairs, one to go into the first floor. Uh, transom windows above. And then uh, when they take off that, 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 that brick and metal awning, they're going to have to figure out what's underneath it. It's assumed that there's a big metal beam back here that will just be um, basically covered over with, with, with bricks. Um, and similar design on the front. Some of the brick little column pillar things will still continue to come all the way down to the ground. This one is here, this one is here. This large brick divider in the middle of the building stays. You can see this one stays, this one stays, and this one over here. Um, but it is opening it up um, much more. And uh, this one has the accordion windows, this one does not. The brick is, is, is infill. Um, it's not gonna match exactly, that's fine. This storefront was, uh, is, is a more recent one as well. I don't know what it dates to. I think it was before um, I got here 13 years ago. But you can see that the proportions here, it, 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 it steps well from um, this more historic uh, little, little, little storefront cornice here um, up a little bit as the street rises, carries across, and then it steps up a little bit more um, to this storefront. So it's, it's all very proportionate. Things line up rather well as you're going up the hill here. Um, that's all very intentional and I think it ties in uh, great. There's information, details on the windows, um, <coughs> quite a few of them in the packet. From the Secretary of Interior Standards, I have read to you 1, 2, 9, and 10. The Secretary of Interior's guidelines for storefronts recommend designing and constructing a new storefront when the historic one is completely missing maybe an accurate restoration, or be a new design that's compatible with the size, scale, material, and color of the historic building. I do believe that this is uh, compatible in design and scale and color. 
Uh, not recommended introducing a new design that's incompatible. For building site, uh, not recommended is removing or radically changing buildings and their features, which are important in defining the overall historic character of the building. So as a result, the, the character is diminished. Um, if you felt partial to um, preserving this forever as its 1976 self, then you would want to keep those brick and metal awnings. Um, I prefer and think that there is enough historic integrity in what's left to at least um, bring some of the historic feel and character back to this, these, these buildings. Ann Arbor Historic District Design Guidelines for Storefronts recommend uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, this says, uh, it adds that new designs should be flush with the facade and be kept as simple as possible. This is flush and this is simple, only the doors are inset uh, as required by code. It's not appropriate to install a new storefront that's incompatible in size and material with the historic building and district. Um, no signs are proposed on these three storefronts at this time. Um, so uh, unless they're keeping the current signs, uh, we'll have to figure out where those are gonna go later. Um, that would probably be a new application. Um, but at this time, uh, staff finds this redesign appropriate and meets the Secretary of Interior's standards and guidelines and the Ann Arbor Historic District Design Guidelines. Thank you. All right, thank you. Commissioner Hall, Review Committee, any thoughts? Uh, that's a thorough staff report. I don't really have anything else to add from our site. So do you? I don't know. I've got nothing. Yeah. All right, so uh, with the applicant, please come forward, provide your name for the record, and please sign in. Applicant, applicant. Mm. Oh. All right, we don't have any additional questions for the applicant, and we'll move on to the public hearing. Are there members of the public who would like to speak on this agenda item? I'm guessing no. Um, we have questions for ourselves that we'll bring up in discussion, so I will now close the public hearing portion of the application and move on to a motion. Is there a commissioner who would like to make a motion? I'll do it. Commissioner Kian. I move that the commission issue a certificate of appropriateness for the application. Oh. Am I on the right one? Yes. At 120 West Washington Street, a contributing property in the Main Street Historic District to replace the storefront at 118 and 120 West Washington and 117 South Ashley as proposed. The work is compatible in exterior design, arrangement, texture, material, and the relationship to the rest of the building and the surrounding area and meets the Ann Arbor Historic District design guidelines for storefronts and windows the Secretary of the Interior's Standards for Rehabilitation and Guidelines for Rehabilitating Historic Buildings, in particular Standards 1, 2, and 9, and the Guidelines for Storefronts and Building Site. Support. Seconded by Commissioner White. Is there a discussion on the motion? I had one question. Go ahead. Um, it comes from the staff report and the mention of signs and that there's no signs listed and mm -hmm. so it's just more I mean I would have asked the applicant where they intend to put the signs but I I would like there to be like an intentional place for signs if even if the applicant um, doesn't know mm -hmm. yeah. wouldn't it be nice if these redesigns had some spot where you could put a sign and maybe there is I just can't quite tell because the elevations are kind of a small scale Mm -hmm. There's that band that they're going to have to cover the steel beam with. Is that deep enough for a typical sign? On, I'm not talking about a blade sign, obviously, because yeah. there's definitely yeah. spots. There's a blade yeah. sign right there. But like where it says Grizzly Peak Brewing, if you want to do the same thing on those two new storefronts, is there a spot that's available that's obvious? And, yeah, and that brick, uh, right now they're showing kind of a brick roll lock above it. It's just, just hard. Brick, roll lock would be like eight inches tall. And then the it's wind. And then up above that would be. That was the part that we were trying to. Uh, Jill had some clarification for us on that one too. The, the part above, go to the. Mm -hmm. Just then you're getting into the store yeah. brick above, above that. that. Do you remember what's I'm sorry, above what was that? the question? What's, what's above this? Yeah, that area. Uh, it's just more brick. Yeah, more brick. Photo. It's, it's, oh, so there's, there's, right. there's brick behind this. They're just not sure. They, they just haven't seen the beam that's back there yet. Um, if you look at the buildings uh, to the side, let me go down here to the. Um, yeah, so you can see that brick. Yeah, so, so pretty much, yeah, everything was removed. Everything was removed um, below 
a um, little bit below the sills here. Mm -hmm. So, so actually, that's a good question. There might, there might not be anything there. There might not be anything there. Yeah, that looks like yeah. there might be yeah. anything there. Yeah. And they'll yeah. just replace it with brick, with, mo with new brick, mm -hmm. according to the elevation. And that's where a sign could go, theoretically, although it's split into thirds. But Yeah. Yeah. But then is I, that kind of above the sign band zone? I mean, it's all well, up high. There's not really one on this block because the corner building has a, a vertical. vertical sign on yeah. the corner. Um, this one has a couple of blades now. The Grizzly Peak sign is there. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll line up pretty much with the row lock. Yeah. Bricks. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's that infill portion right behind the metal canopy that we don't know exactly what it's going to be. Like, go to the demo again yeah. on the main. So the demo. Um, that, yeah, yeah, we don't. Yeah. It's clear from the historic photo from the 70s. Or before the seven, before the fire, yeah. that that was open. Yeah, it looks like it was open. And I question whether those those verticals that are dividing in three parts in the new elevation, if those are just above the. Um, if those are really there, because yeah, we don't know when if those are really there. there. Yeah. Because when you look at the existing photo, obviously it's covered by that metal roof, but there's a row lock of brick mm -hmm. that clearly separates. So. So I guess by and large, is this enough that we can still move ahead on the motion or not? Well, I think we can move ahead. Without the help again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think they're just going to yeah. have to and then they'll come back. keep me informed. Reveal. Keep me informed. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. And if it's something other than brick or if they find something unexpected or don't know what to do with it, they'll have to come back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds fine by me. Any other discussion on the motion? Are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All right, all those in favor of the motion, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Uh, the motion carries. Your application has been approved and you will receive written notification from staff. Please note that you must apply for any re required permits from the city before beginning on your project. All right, next item is F6505 2nd Street. This two and a half story gable fronter features a full width front porch and shows craftsman influences in its four over one and six over one windows, exposed rafter tails and upper story wood shingles with lower story lap siding. It was constructed in 1916 for Emmanuel G. and Meta J. Stadel. Mrs. Stadel lived here until 1952 or 53. Property is located on the southeast corner of 2nd Street and West Jefferson. And the applicant is seeking HTC approval to construct an 87 square foot bathroom addition off the rear southeast corner of the house and replace a non-historic casement window with a pair of large double-hung windows. Uh, this house is very prominent since it's on a corner in the heart of the Old West Side. Um, the proposal is to add a small bathroom. This is the Jefferson side, um, and the Second Street side is the front porch side. Uh, you can see the whole yard all the way around. I mean, it's a corner lot, and it's pretty open. Um, the only area that you can't see is perhaps behind the garage, but um, even so, uh, let me go back up here to, nope, I didn't have a good side view there. Um, there's, there's a small porch on the back um, on the east side, uh, leads out toward the garage. Half of it has been enclosed. It's the, the porch shows up on Sanborn maps. Uh, I think it's always been there. I don't know how long it's been half enclosed, um, but the, the roof line is a historic feature of the house. And uh, the applicant has gone to pains to preserve all of this that you see here, even though it's had this infill, and, and the infill is uh, proposed to be changed a little bit too. Um, I'm going to cut right down here to uh, the proposed addition is 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 kind of separate from the house. It's 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 a little wing unto itself. Um, here it is. Here's the here's the covered porch on the back with the door that comes in. Um, to this vestibule. I think I've called that the mudroom uh, throughout the report if you're confused. It's got a little connector here that's lower and then it's got a very compact bathroom with a shower uh, and some a large window facing the backyard here and there's a large window on the other. Uh, no, there's no window on this side. There's no windows on the bathroom portion at all but there are some window changes proposed here on the mudroom, the vestibule. You might want to look in your packet. These didn't come out very well um, in the scan, but uh, lower connector hyphen portion and then a very low slope, nearly flat roof. 
um, on this little box that's going to sit here. There's a couple of trees that were important to the owners that they didn't want to mess with, um, so they're avoiding those. Uh, this is a view from, uh, it's such a bad photo that I can't even really tell. I, and it's all smashed up, so let's just skip that one. <laughs> so here's the back of the house existing. This is an original window, this is an original window. They're not going to do anything to those. But this is that infill uh, casement window that they would like to uh, replace with two double hungs. This is the little hyphen um, for the big daylight window there, get a lot of light into the space. And then we have the bathroom here. It's a very interesting way to not muck up a historic house by touching it as little as possible. It, the connector is mostly on this non-original sidewall of the, the, the mudroom enclosure. It touches the, the sidewall of the house a little tiny bit, but not very much. It's, it's as minimal as humanly possible. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's got you know, AZEC trim, and um, the siding is four-inch smooth hardy board painted to match the existing siding. I believe that the existing siding is a three-and-a-half-inch reveal, so compatible but not exactly the same. Masonry block foundation, um, very straightforward. Uh, there's some window details for the proposed new windows. Um, the Secretary of Interior standards that best apply are numbers 2, 9, and 10. I've already read those to you. The guidelines for additions say construct a new addition so that there's the least possible loss of historic materials and so that character defining features are not obscured, damaged, or destroyed. Again, this went to great pains to avoid uh, even touching historic materials, uh, let alone impacting them. Uh, it does make clear, very clear, what's historic and what is new. Um, it's located on an exterior addition uh, on an inconspicuous side of the historic building. It's as inconspicuous as you can get on a corner lot um, with a high level of visibility. And its size is certainly limited in scale um, and size in relationship to the historic building. It's 87 square feet. Um, the Secretary of Interior Guidelines for Additions recommends considering the attached addition both in terms of the new use and the appearance of other buildings in the historic district or neighborhood. Design may be contemporary or may reference design motifs from the historic building. I consider this kind of a uh, uh, perfect confluence of both. It's, 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 it's a contemporary structure, um, but it has motifs that it's picked up from the house. Um, and in either case, it should always be clearly differentiated from the historic building and be compatible in terms of mass materials, relationship of solids to voids, and color. Not recommended is uh, attaching an addition so character-defining features are obscured, damaged, or destroyed or so that its size and scale uh, in relation to the historic building are out of proportion, thus diminishing the historic character. From the Ann Arbor Historic District design <coughs> guidelines for all additions, um, the addition's footprint should not exceed one half of the original building's footprint or one half of the original building's total floor area. Pretty much everything you see except the little tiny mudroom are orig original um, floor area in this house. Um, so this is an extremely minimal impact. I think it's... Uh, the footprint will increase by 11% and the floor area by 6%. Uh, staff's opinion that the work is appropriate and does not destroy historic materials, features, spaces, or spatial relationships. Corner lots are tough, but this one, uh, but this one is so intentionally minimal that it works extremely well. It's differentiated adequately while remaining complementary to the historic house and district. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Holland, do you want to add anything? Uh, the only thing I would add is it is on the corner lot, obviously. So Jefferson, which arguably is the busier street, you wouldn't really even hardly see it from right there. You wouldn't, I don't think you'd really see it. And even on second, because of the, they're maintaining these trees, so on, I mean, it's, it is very minimal. Um, we did uh, ask the architect and owner about some of the details on the foundation wall um, in terms of the basement window that's also there, uh, which, how do we classify Do you have a photo? Did we get a photo of that side? There's a window that is underneath that elevation. I can't really see it there. It's in a bush. It just goes to a crawl oh, there space. It is. Yeah, there and it goes right into a crawl space area. And it's right all of these cover it. There. Yeah. Um, so that window still uh, just had a storm window over it. It didn't have an actual window inside of it, a fixed window, so they're not losing any historic resource there either. Um, what else can we say about it? That's it. All right.
Good. Uh, moving on to, would the applicant please come forward uh, and state your name for the record and sign in. And if you have anything to add to the staff report or review committee report, please do so. Hello, my name is Veronica Pinyazic. Uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, Zach Cruz Construction and my clients. Um, and the staff report finding was uh, good. I don't really have anything to add. <laughs> um, all right, you, while you're signing in, I'll go to the next part, which is uh, any commissioners have any questions for the applicant? Because I have one. Um, I, oh. Do you want to go? Go for it. Just real quick. Um, so I saw, and if I miss this, I'm sorry, but um, mm -hmm. I see some new gutters called out on the elevations mm -hmm. um, for both the, well, I guess for the new addition and then the, the connecting, the hyphen portion which Correct. is a flat roof, but I don't see any downspout. Uh, yes, they are not sh shown on uh, the So drawings. I'm just wondering where those would be. And um, is there an existing gutter on the There's an existing, existing gutter on the... Uh, I couldn't quite tell yeah. from the photo. Yes, yeah, so they're right, see that, that vertical right on that corner? Yeah. They're in that corner right now. Okay. Um, we would like to move them to the other corner because that's like there's air conditioners and stuff going there that were approved for a separate project. Um, so yeah, they would be on the side that you're currently looking at. Okay. Maybe on the yeah, because there will be a hyphen there. Yeah. So so that the one that's curious how going. it would work on the hyphen because it's. So are you are you saying that? Hyphen's lower too. What? Here? Just yeah, it's just spot a, on each side. Just a flat roof. I, they weren't shown, so, yeah. and it's very tight. So <laughs> it is. Yeah, it'll be tight. It'll be a lot of gutters in a small yeah. spot. Yeah, so. Not so sure how much that will affect the overall application, but yeah. it's something for you to think about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions for the applicant? I was wondering about the wood windows. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe a little bit more about the wood windows? There's a cut sheet, but I wasn't sure of the, the, um, the, the manufacturer yeah. or if you're custom building them. Or. Um, yeah, so we use uh, Kelly windows. They do um, aluminum plaid, wood windows, historic, um, double hung, so they're operable. And so these are wood or they're aluminum clad wood? Aluminum clad wood, okay. yes. That's what I was trying to look for too. And I I think they just say wood in the report. Yeah, it just says wood double hung. But okay, yeah. Aluminum right clad wood is also acceptable. It just mm -hmm. want to get the details right. Yeah. Yeah, it does say all wood windows. Um, would you like to correct that to wood or clad wood windows? Um, right now, it's specifying just wood. Okay, so yes, I'd do clad wood. I, I can correct that to that. Okay, so you guys can consider that when you talk about it. Okay. If you're okay with that. We'll get to that. Okay. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? No, there are any questions. All right, moving on to the public hearing. Are there members of the public who would like to speak on this agenda item? No. Nope. Uh, I will now close the public hearing portion of the application, and the applicant may please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would any commissioner like to make a motion on this application? Commissioner Rockland. Okay. I move that the commission issue a certificate of appropriateness for the application at 505 Second Street, a contributing proper, property in the Old West Side Historic District, to construct an 87 square foot bathroom addition off the rear southeast corner of the house and replace non historic casement windows with a pair of large double hung windows wood or aluminum clad wood as proposed. The work is compatible in exterior design, arrangement materials, and relationship to the house and the surrounding area and meets the City of Ann Arbor Historic District design guidelines for all additions and the, historic, the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation and guidelines for rehabilitating historic buildings. In particular, standards 2, 9, and 10 and the guidelines for district or neighborhood setting and new additions. Support. Seconded by Commissioner White. Is there any further discussion? This seems to fit standard nine really well. That the new work should be differentiated and compatible. So I'll just say that for the record. Any other discussion? 
I'm comfortable with wood or aluminum clad yeah. wood windows. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah, I figured as much. <laughs> I, I'll just make one comment, yeah. uh, though, if you have a second yeah, go ahead. my go time. Ahead. Sure. Uh, I think just the, uh, the hyphen connection to the historic home with a flat roof, I think, is um, like conceptually and aesthetically like a really positive way to connect to a historic structure. I think technically there is some yeah. complication <laughs> that I'm sure that will be resolved, but it's just when you have a flat roof with, you know, if you have a roof with very low slope against wood, there can be an issue in our yeah. climate. Reason. So <laughs> it just needs to be taken care of technically, um, but I think it's worth it for the, the visual, you know, and conceptual connection, uh, as long as it's resolved in construction. Yeah, All right. and it's a, a small roof, so even a very small 2% slope will help. And it will be very not noticeable, I guess. All right. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. All right. The motion carries. Your application has been approved, and you will receive written notification from staff. Uh, please note that you must apply for any required permits from the city before beginning your project. Thank you. All right. Then we're moving on to G new business. And here we have 530 North Division status reconsideration. Just go through the same presentation. Yep. So All right, staff. Public hearing. All right, yeah. great. Uh, so under review tonight is whether the residential building at 530 North Division Street should be classified as a contributing structure, also known as a historic resource in the Old Fourth Ward Historic District, or whether the designation should be amended to non-contributing. Um, so just as a refresher, the owner of 530 North Division requested a working session with the HDC. Um, which was held on March 14th, and the HCC expressed reservations about the proposed work being able to meet federal and local standards and guidelines as a contributing structure. So then the HTC directed staff to revisit the building's contributing, non-contributing status and place that discussion on the April 11 agenda. And at that meeting, the HTC requested that staff hold a public hearing at a future meeting and give the applicant time to collect more information to submit to the commission. Uh, so the April 11 staff report is attached. I'm not going to go through the whole thing again. Um, the property owner has provided um, a lot of new information. There's a petition for the reclassification of the structure, uh, an appendix, and a structural engineering report, all of which are very pertinent to this discussion tonight. Um, uh, so I, I don't have much of a staff report uh, prepared. I've got the slides from uh, last month, two months ago, if you want to uh, reference them at all. Um, I think you guys had a pretty robust discussion of the exterior of the building and you know features that were visible, uh, not visible. Um, staff does believe that um, the argument about historic integrity that the applicant makes in some in, in his his petition um, should certainly be closely considered by the HDC. Uh, the Secretary of the Interior, we went over that a little tiny bit at the last meeting. Um, those were attached um, about the seven aspects of integrity that you have to consider. Uh, when designating a historic structure. Uh, certainly it doesn't, this structure doesn't meet a couple of those. That's flat off, that's, that's easy. And then there are a couple others that are um, a little bit um, more arguable either way. Um, but this is a tough one. And um, so I, I would suggest that you walk through some of those seven uh, stages of integrity, seven character, um, seven, what is the aspects. word? Aspects, thank you, of integrity, uh, because they are important. Um, we will be holding a public hearing on this, um, and but I would ask that the, the applicant come up and give his report first, just like, you know, a normal, yep, normal, stuff. Is normal stuff, normal application. Uh, so that concludes staff's report, but I'm happy to offer any other information or opinions uh, as we get into this more. Thank you. Great. Um, and then do we need to add anything from review committee, any additional? Uh, the review committee didn't visit the property because it was the same two people that were here when we took these pictures. Um, so there was no mm -hmm. new information to be gleaned. Right. Okay. We went over it. Yeah, we went over it. Yeah. Just making it That's on right, the record. you were on it. I was on it. <laughs> Just making sure it's on the record. Got it. Uh, all right, would the applicant please come forward, state your name for the record, and sign in. And if you have anything to add to the staff report and the review committee report, please do so, which I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so 
necessary to get this done. Doug, you are not limited to three or five minutes. Um, I hope because not. I would rather have <laughs> you go through this stuff than me just, you know, Thank you. repeating your stuff back. So. Well, um, good evening, and uh, I wanted uh, to all of you and the uh, Jill, uh, the historic district coordinator, too. Uh, and I wanted to say thanks for giving this opportunity for a public hearing. Uh, obviously, at issue tonight is whether uh, 530 and 532 North Division should be classified as a contributing historic resource or whether that can rightly be changed to a non-contributing resource. Um, since our last meeting, I decided to look into what that means. Um, having never really read through the guidelines and things, I did read through the uh, Secretary of the Interior's uh, Guide to Preservation Planning uh, and the State Historic Office, uh, Historic Preservation Office, uh, SHPO, also has a written set of guidelines that largely mirror the federal guidelines, uh, although it did contain some interesting um, uh, other information. Also read through the founding documents of the Old Fourth Ward Historic District, and um, uh, I learned a lot. Um, it uh, might not be great beach reading, or uh, you know, um, like a book that you can't put down or anything. But um, I did come away with some things. Um, I learned a lot more about what you guys do and gain a better appreciation for the role of historic district commissions. Um, learning about terms like historic contracts, context, and historic integrity, um, and I found that there is a set of rules and guidelines for interpreting what defines a contributing historic resource and that there is also a process for local historic districts to, uh, to determine, make that determination for their own locality. Um, I will say that I think that most people find this whole process to be pretty baffling. Um, I, I know I did uh, before really uh, reading into it and looking into it and I think that a large part of that is that most people simply lack the tools to know how you're making decisions. Um, and a larger conversation probably ought to be had about that. Um, as a builder, I find myself, after reading these, to be uh, a little more aware of the importance of these unique historic structures and, and what they mean to the community. Um, I also did come away with the feeling, though, that many of the rules for applying these tests are uh, almost purposely vague. Uh, that they are, uh, and that is presumably so that local uh, interpretation can, uh, can be intact. And the guidelines do say that the municipality itself must defend the resources as they are currently in place, but um, uh, also that that's the reason for a historic district commission is to make calls about what's in the best interest of the community and also how to keep historic districts relevant uh, as time goes on. Um, and in fact, these guidelines say things like, uh, these terms are artificial constructs which may be revised as necessary. Uh, new information must be reviewed regularly and systematically and the plan revised accordingly. And um, things like uh, all properties change over time. The property must retain, however, the essential physical features that enable it to convey its historic identity. Um, at our last meeting, uh, as Jill noted, one, uh, one or two of our commissioners suggested that I might get a structural engineer's report, um, and I have done so. Uh, it's Appendix B. I, 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 um, uh, if you haven't looked at it, it, it would be good to look at that. Um, I uh, also prepared the petition you saw for the commission. Those are in your packet as well. There is, I don't know if you got it, but there is a, an Appendix A, which is uh, an analysis of historic context in the, in the setting. Um, for any discussion and determination of a property within a historic district, there needs to be a common understanding of facts and history of that uh, resource. And since the city lacks uh, really many relevant records from the period of significance or even really 30 years later, I also commissioned a history of the property um, myself, and this is what I learned. Uh, it first appears on the 1866 bird's eye map of Ann Arbor as a small single family home. Uh, as you go through the decades of the periods of significance, the house has moves around quite a bit. The, there's a side part, and then it becomes a back part. And what's really interesting is the outbuildings move all over the place too, uh, shrinking and growing. Um, and um, so there were two owners of the property that uh, lived in the home uh, in the 1800s, uh, from six, 1966 uh, to the end of the 1800s. And then in the 1900s, just at the turn of the century, the house began being rented out uh, as a single family home. In 1929 and 1930, uh, just prior to the end of the original period of significance, a home larger than the existing home was moved onto the site and conjoined and it became 530 and 532 North Division. 
And after that, the uh, uh, property was two single family homes, which it remained for several, uh, at least a couple decades. Um, in the 1950s, a very significant change took place. Uh, the building went from a two single family homes uh, to a multi family apartment building. Um, the front bump out porch and porch roofs were added. Uh, so none of that that you see there uh, was there in the period of significance. Um, asphalt shingles were added over the clapboard siding. The interior walls were completely rearranged with interior stairs presumably removed and a load bearing wall that would have carried them uh, in the south building. And the reason we think that is just the, uh, the way the, the layout is, there is no stair going to the second floor in the south building. There's also um, joists that uh, on the second floor that have settled a lot, uh, showing severe uh, stress on, this, on the floor system. Our thought is if you look at the way, way the rest of the building was constructed in the 30s and 50s, it is probably likely that if you remove the ceiling, you would find that the original joist with the original load bearing wall and then a, they probably just carried a, a joist across there and nailed them together. Uh, you're seeing that in the rafters in the attic uh, quite a bit as well as uh, down in the basement uh, in the joists that are visible there. Um, Two bathrooms and two kitchens were added at that time uh, to make four apartments. And the roof was propped up with support members to keep it from collapsing. Uh, the roof, are, roof is two by fours um, with, uh, that are two, 32 inches on center, irregularly spaced. So I guess not on center, but they're about 32 inches apart. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, they simply took some boards and propped them up uh, to hold up the rest of the roof. The, Two by fours that they did that with are resting directly on the ceiling joists, which are also two by fours. Really explains why the ceilings are so wavy upstairs. Um, there are no city records of this work, nor are there any photographs that I know of uh, or that uh, the person who researched this home, Susan Weinberg, was uh, able to find from the period of significance. Sometime in the eight, late 80s and early 90s, the windows were replaced with vinyl windows and vinyl siding was replaced over the previous two layers of siding. In 1999, my wife and I purchased this research source. Uh, it was at the time literally a derelict structure uh, with homeless people and everything living there. Um, I was at the time a 30-year-old man with little building experience. Uh, I made the immediate repairs that the house needed at the time, uh, and I made it look cosmetically good in the apartments uh, so that we could rent them out. Um, but I, at the time, uh, did not have really much build, building experience, and I certainly didn't have the financial resources to fix the building at the time. Uh, this is probably a good thing that I didn't start trying, because if you pull one string on this thing, you're fixing the whole thing. Um, I did have Bill Yudlowsky place uh, three sides of the original north half foundation at the time, uh, which were imploding. Um, and uh, kind of a representative of much of the work in the house, to be honest. Uh, I think I should also mention the history of the old Fourth Ward Historic District, which was founded in 1982. Uh, this resource was classified as complementary. In the 1982 survey, uh, significant resources had their histories documented and the resources were photographed. Complementary resources had a single historic context for their inclusion, that they existed in their current form in 1931. Uh, around 2006, all of the formerly significant and complementary resources were lumped together as contributing resources. Uh, there was apparently a survey of these properties taken at the time, but it seems like um, becoming com contributing from complementary was pretty perfunctory at that point. Uh, I don't know if any were not at that time, but it seems like all of them were. Um, there was certainly no research on the history of the property, nor any structural analysis. Um, there was also no application of the Secretary of Interior's or SHPO's guidelines to determine if this property had historic context or historic integrity. Uh, that's the history of the property. Uh, both the projects in the 1930s uh, and, and the 1950s were performed in the absolute cheapest way that you could possibly do it uh, with no regard to aesthetics or planning. Um, for the vast majority of the period of significance, this was a single family home. Uh, the last few years of that period, in my opinion, did not create a complete context of the resource. And I would argue that context is formed throughout time, not immediately conferred by uh, uh, a property um, due to an arbitrary date. But even if you only take the last few years of the period of significance as all that matters, 
Uh, the project in the 1950s converted this into a multifamily structure, which is a different property type uh, and was long after the period of significance ended. Um, so the argument I'm making here centers around the different definitions of historic context and historic integrity, as well as what is defined in the Old Fourth Ward Historic District as uh, in the founding documents. Um, this particular resource never had the merits as a contributing uh, historical resource tested against those guidelines. Um, it, and uh, much of this, uh, what uh, I've been able to find and present is uh, new information uh, available to the Historic District Commission. The guidelines do say that new information must be considered in order to keep historic districts relevant. Um, if you test this resource against those guidelines, uh, I think you would find time and time again that it falls short of the guidelines in substantial ways, and I believe it does not meet the threshold of a contributing historic resource. Um, that's my opinion. I know I'm biased, uh, but uh, I think um, and going through it, uh, if you apply these tests and standards, you may find that to be the case yourself, and I want to do my best to prove that here. Uh, I wanted to start out by talking about historic context. Um, the Secretary of Interior says that a historic district is defined as a significant concentration, linkage, or, or continuity of resources united historically or aesthetically by a plan or design. The historic's identity is a result of the interrelationship between individual resources that work together to create a sense of visual, uh, visual sense of its history. The development of historic context is the foundation for decisions about identification, evaluation, registration and treatment of historic properties. And a single historic context describes one or more aspects of the historic development of an area and identifies the significant patterns that individual properties, historic properties represent. Um, so with that in mind, that's how the uh, Old Fourth Ward Historic uh, District founding documents were created. And from that document, we can see that the patterns and context uh, of the Old Fourth Ward are such that the architectural styles within the district, um, specifically Greek Revival, uh, Gothic, Italianate, Queen Anne, shingle styles, and varied revival styles of the 20th century, uh, an inventory of outstanding and significant historic structures, the neighborhood's relationship to well-known educators and early schools, Ann Arbor's first synagogue, many churches, and the only remaining livery barn, and while having a mix of uses, it was primarily residential, apartments, boarding houses, and single-family homes. The chronological time period of significance for complementary structures uh, were included, uh, and for these ones, that was listed as their only context. Um, I want to get in the weeds just for a minute here. Uh, from the Secretary of the Interior, uh, historic context as theoretic, theoretical constructs are linked to actual historic properties through the concept of property type. Property types permit the development of plans for identification, evaluation, and treatment, even in the absence of complete knowledge of individual properties. And like historic context, property types are artificial constructs which may be revised as necessary. Um, I feel that uh, that is saying that the archetypes and patterns in the neighborhood are good enough to list a home even if the historic district lacks complete knowledge of the property. Uh, and that makes sense. I feel that you can find histor history in the form of a building. Uh, you can find it in the materials that are prevalent here and there throughout the neighborhood uh, as an original piece. Um, uh, and um, so I would ask, you know, what is the typology of this resource and what is it that relates it to the neighborhood other than it being there? Um, both the Sec Secretary of the Interior and SHPO also caution, caution against being overly broad in classifying historic resource. The Secretary of the Interior's document says that historic context should not be constructed so broadly as to include all property types under his, a single historic context. And it also hints that time period is subordinate to other contexts by saying the chronological period and graphical area of each historic context should be defined after the conceptual basis is established. So to me, that says in pretty clear language that while the time period is important, uh, it, is, it is only one context and not, should not be the sole basis for uh, the decision. Uh, the SHPO guidelines are actually a little bit more specific yet saying, a property is not eligible, however, if it retains some basic features conveying massing, but has lost the majority of features so that once characterized its style. Uh, this building had the bump out the porch and the porch roofs added since the period of significance. Uh, and what is left is literally the definition of massing. It's a box with a 4 and 12 gable roof. Um, so it, it's so simple it really doesn't even have a name. Uh, so without that massing, what are the features that characterize its style? And I would argue that there isn't a style because in reality, 
somebody took a house that was probably a free or nearly free resource right before the end of the original period of significance and decided to double their rental income by conjoining them together uh, in the most crude manner possible. Um, a moved property is also problematic from a context perspective with criterion C of the defining essential physical features saying a moved property significant under criterion C must retain enough historic features to convey its architectural values and retain the integrity of design, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. The historic context of a property is also found in the property types patterns of use and there again this building has changed since the period of significance when this property went from being a single family home to two single family homes and then long afterwards became a multi um, unit apartment building. So this change makes the apartment uh, or the property type and the historic context different than what they would have been at any time during the period of significance. Uh, I would argue that any historic context this resource uh, once had was destroyed by these, uh, this series of events. Um, the historic context of this resource has to be more than just the massing or a particular cutoff date. And I feel those are specifically mentioned in evaluating a resource. Um, but even if you don't agree that the historic resource, uh, historic context of this resource is gone, and somehow that its patterns of use in the structure itself, itself inform the beholder of its place in history, that still by the guidelines would not be enough to call this a contributing historic resource. Um, was mentioned the seven aspects of historic integrity, and they are location, setting, design, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. The Secretary of Interior says that when evaluating those res resources that retention of design, workmanship, and materials will usually be more important than location, setting, feeling, and association. The Secretary of Interior also brought, uh, broadly defines historic integrity thusly. Integrity is the ability of the property to convey its significance. To retain historic integrity, a property will always possess several and usually most of the aspects. The retention of specific aspects of integrity is paramount for the property to convey its significance. So uh, there is a series of steps to defining historic integrity as put forth by the Secretary of Interior and I'd like to break those down here. Uh, step one is identify what the property represents. Historic contexts are historical patterns that can be identified through consideration of the history of the property and the surrounding resources. So what exactly does this property represent? It's currently a multifamily structure, something that never existed in any form on that property in the period of significance. What architectural context does it represent? Uh, clearly not in the old Fourth Ward founding documents uh, list of type property types that should be considered. What patterns are the same from when it was a, a one or a two, uh, two single family homes? I don't find it to be very similar at all. Um, and I would argue that it certainly doesn't inform anyone of the history of the site or, or the district. Uh, step two, determine if the property type, it, determine what the property type is and determine whether it is important in illustrating historical context, historic context. The property type cannot be fit stylistically into what the old Fourth Ward founding documents are saying are the context for the neighborhood from an architectural standpoint. Um, and we've seen that taking a broad brush approach to context like existence in a point in time period or massing alone do not create enough context to become a property type by the rules. Um, the properties also changed significantly, uh, becoming a multifamily building in, which is a different property type than any time during the period of significance. Step three says determine how the property represents the context through sp specific historic associations, architectural engineer engineering values, or information potential, the criterion for evaluation. Uh, there are no people of note who lived here, um, that's important. Uh, the building carries no architectural value in creating neighborhood context. And uh, Criterion C also uh, says uh, a property uh, under Criterion C must retain those physical features that characterize the, the type, period, or method of construction that the property represents. Retention of design, workmanship, and materials, again, will usually be more important than location, setting, feeling, and association. Criterion C also, rec also cautions against giving moved properties automatic historic integrity without a rigorous application of the guidelines. Uh, so again, what are the physical features that characterize the neighborhood and its patterns in this resource? What are the methods of constructions or architectural styles uh, that is representative of the neighborhood? And um, uh, 
then uh, step four, determine what the physical features of the property must possess in order for it to reflect the significance of historic context. Those physical features can be determined after identifying the following. Types of property that are associated with the historic context, the ways in which the properties can re re represent the theme, and the applicable aspects of integrity. The resource doesn't represent a property type without being overly broad in application. The resource does not carry themes of the old Fourth Ward Historic District. Uh, it's different than all others, pretty much. Uh, and so then the third point, let's break down the aspects, um, starting with the ones that are listed as most important. Uh, first off, design. Uh, this is a combination of elements that create form, plan, structure, and style of the property. And from the Secretary of Interior, uh, they say it results from conscious decisions made during the original conception and planning of the property or its significant alteration. It also applies to the ways in which building site structures are related. For example, spatial relations between major features or visual rhythms on the streetscape, of the streetscape. As you can read from the structural engineer's report, this roof line and subsequent rebuilding of the structure after the period of significance were anything but well planned or executed. As a result, this, this resource has no visual rhythm with the rest of the street. It's both hulking and diminutive at the same time, uh, and it shares not one material or feature with another home on, on the block. The building also conveys no obvious architectural style, uh, and aesthetics were of no concern in this case. They didn't even try. Uh, in the material section, uh, Materials are the physical elements that were combined or deposited during a particular period of time and in a particular pattern or configuration to form a historic property. And a historic property must retain the, the, the key exterior materials dating from the period of its historic significance. Um, there are no key historic materials left other than maybe some old clapboard sidings under two layers of, of uh, other siding. That would be one material, but would not count, in my opinion, as key exterior materials, plural. Um, I have a hard time believing that potential clapboards would count as key materials, but in any event, I've pledged to save any usable materials from this building that I can salvage from the home. Uh, and the clapboards probably have their very best chance of surviving with uh, me uh, restoring them than in any other way, uh, which I have pledged to do. Workmanship is the next category. The Secretary of Interior calls workmanship in part the following. Uh, the physical evidence of the craft or of a particular culture or people during any given period of history. It is evidence of the artisan's skill, labor and skill in constructing or altering a building, structure, object, or site. Workmanship can apply to the property as a whole or to its individual components. Uh, I want to read a few excerpts from the Structural Engineer's Report. Uh, Severely undersized rafters, scabbed together scraps of lumber nailed, nailed for support in the material, cripples resting on two by four ceiling joists that are not adequate to bear any weight, let alone a significant portion of the roof load, improperly built and severely undersized roof structure. Uh, in quotes, I would worry about roof members failing under heavy snow loads or with a roof replacement. Uh, and also in quotes, it's frankly hard to believe this roof structure has lasted as long as it has. Uh, Improper load paths creating moderate to severe stress on the floor systems. Notched and compromised floor joists from poor remodeling work. Evidence of, com of a compromised rubble foundation under the crawl space. An inaccessible scrawl crawl space with wood members within inches of a dirt floor. And finally, this structure is in poor conditions and showing, showing signs of stress in many areas. Uh, if you read the report and look at the pictures, it's no wonder that the report's conclusion recommends complete replacement of the roof structures and a complete gut and rebuild of the structure. Uh, it's hard to find any piece of workmanship in the house, interior or exterior, that is an example of an artisan's skill. Um, there are no finished, uh, no, there, there is no finished workmanship in the house, new or old, that I believe meets that definition. The structure itself has been hacked at and compromised for so long that it does not have historic integrity. Um, so those are the three import, more important aspects of historic integrity, and I believe none of the three of these are met. But we also have to look at location, setting, feeling, and association. Uh, location simply where the resource is located. Um, simple enough, uh, but this aspect also says that except for in rare cases, the relationship between a property and its historic associations 
is destroyed if the property is moved. And I can certainly see why a, taking another structure from another location and moving it onto this property would destroy the context that the resource had. Uh, it was right before the end of the original period of significance. So um, you could say that uh, this building uh, retains historic context, but I again believe that its uh, historic context is not instantly earned. Uh, it's created over time by people and activity and rhythms of a neighborhood. Uh, this should be the easiest of, this as of the aspects to say that it is uh, to say yes to, but in this case, even that's not definitive due to the moved nature of the property. Uh, setting. The interior secretary says, whereas location refers to the specific space, setting refers to the, how the character of the place in which the property played its, its historic role. It involves how, not just where the property is situated, and its relationship to the surrounding features. Setting often reflects the basic physical conditions under which a property was built and the functions it was intended to serve. Uh, I believe this re resource does not reflect the physical conditions under which it was built nor the functions it was intended to serve originally. Uh, there is no workmanship that is evident and it is fundamentally different than a single family home or two single family homes. I believe the property becoming a multifamily building decades later would have also further destroyed any context uh, or relationship to the surrounding features. Uh, were it still being used as two single family homes, I could see making that argument, uh, but it is a completely different building type now. Um, I believe that that change uh, uh, changed its setting completely and that at that point when, when the 50s remodel happened, that any thread to the past uh, was at that point irrevocably lost. Uh, the feeling section, feeling is the property's expression of the aesthetic or historic sense of a particular period of time. It results from the presence of physical features that when taken together convey the property's historic character. Uh, because the setting, property type, and historic context have all changed since the period of significance and arguably the location too if you believe what it says about moved structures, what feeling does this resource give you of Ann Arbor prior to World War II? What historic materials give a, this property a sense of place and time? What patterns or property, uh, prop, what patterns, uh, use patterns or property type uh, place this property in that era, that bygone era? It's hard to really think of really even one, let alone the many that are called for. And to this day, it evokes no feeling of the history of the old fourth ward, in my opinion, or retains any context of the neighborhood. Uh, there, to me, there is no feeling here of a historic resource. The last one, association, is simply put, did somebody notable live here or was there an important event at the site? And the answer is no. Uh, so that's the seven aspects of historic integrity. I believe it's hard to say that this re resource has any, let alone many or most of the aspects that are intact. By the definition of historic integrity, this building, in my opinion, does not meet the, the standards of a contributing historic resource. Um, Unless you paint a very broad brush by saying the most, most basic massing was there in 1931 or 1944 uh, or, and therefore it's contributing, it does not meet the standards of historic context. And in fact, such a broad brush approach is specifically mentioned as an example of inappropriate application of context in evaluating a resource. Um, likewise, testing the individual resource for historic integrity yields not many or most aspects being present, but maybe one or two. And I think there's a solid argument to say that it's, the number is actually zero. Uh, I don't see how if those guidelines are properly followed that this can be called a contributing historic resource. But don't take my word for it. Um, uh, two preservation historians who live in the neighborhood and um, literally wrote the book on uh, uh, historic resources um, say this property should be ruled as a non-contributing resource. Uh, the residents of the neighborhood are in support of the status change. The city of Ann Arbor is getting one of their, uh, many of their wish list items for indi individual property development, uh, density, better water management, energy efficient structures, proper documentation of the resource, etc. The 2030 district gets a shining star, a net positive building that is Living Building Challenge certified, the first in the world for a rental structure. The rental housing community, which is the worst offender in all of Ann Arbor's uh, building carbon footprint classes, can be shown a deep energy model that works if you look at a longer payoff period by making the building perform significantly better. 
And I guess your part to play in this is to weigh whether these benefits to the community outweigh the current classification of this resource. Um, by following the process and making the individual analysis of the resource, it is my opinion that it's easier to rule this as a non-contributing structure than to, is to make the case for inclusion. Uh, and that makes the right call here, in my opinion, actually the, the easier call to make. Um, in my opinion, there is more than ample justification for this change. I do want to um, bring one more point into consider, uh, consideration, though, and that is uh, practicality. And I've been told that practicality and logic don't have much of a place here in these considerations, but I actually, in reading through the, uh, all these materials, I disagree with that, and I think it is relevant. Uh, if you read the structural engineer's report, it is clear that this building needs major structural work to every part of it. Um, my wife and I have been saving for a lot of years for a down payment. When we bought the place, we knew that we were going to have to put significant money to it at some point in the future. Uh, and uh, I, we have been saving for a, uh, a lot of years to put a down payment that I would need to acquire a bank loan to work on this property. Um, in order to make the economics worse, work, I need to increase the density by at least six bedrooms, but preferably more. And without that, I cannot get a loan on this property, on this project. If I undertake any structural work on the existing building, the entire structure will have to be rebuilt to, to meet code, uh, with the possible exception of replacing the foundation on the south side. Um, but once you start pulling a string, this thing is going to go all the way. Um, so uh, we can't afford to do that work, to rebuild this building uh, for what is maybe the addition of a couple bedrooms at most, uh, which would be what would happen in that case. And um, the bank will not loan us money for such a project because it is not economically viable. The structure needs intervention. So in a real catch-22 moment, the worst thing that could happen, in my opinion, for this structure is to continue to be listed as a contributing historic resource. There's no economic model that will pay to fix the building as it is now, and it becomes a stranded resource. Uh, the Secretary of Interior actually mentions that economics can be an issue to consider when evaluating resource. And, in reading through those guidelines, I, uh, I get the sense that it applies more to economically distressed areas and decisions that need to be made in those cases, but actually many of the same issues are at play here. Uh, I would argue that with the project I'm proposing as a non-contributing resource, this building has a much better chance to be significant in the neighborhood, even in terms of the context of the old Fourth Ward Historic District founding documents, let alone all the other contexts. It's an excellent way to show that sensitive change can happen in historic districts and making them even more relevant. That these districts are not frozen in time and can be dynamic while still holding their significance. There was a comment at the last meeting noting that I was treating with the building with dis disdain. And I want to say that I don't dislike this house or property. I actually love it. Um, this house and this project are where I became a builder and uh, where it became my career. Uh, I loved every part of it, and I quit my job to go pursue it full time. In particular, green building became my vocation out of this property. Uh, I'm trying to save this house and reverse a long, long cycle of decline it has endured. I'm trying to make it significant in a way that it never was in the past, uh, certainly not in its present form. This would be a resource that fits into the neighborhood and is also ready for the coming century. And it is a structure that could one day acquire historic integrity of its own. That can't happen without a major intervention to correct the deficiencies that are there. And I can guarantee you that nibbling around the edges of this thing will not be a viable path to saving this building. The guidelines offer you an opportunity and the duty to re-examine resources as new information becomes available. And the community is being served by the project that is only available with a classification change. We are asking for the Historic District Commission tonight, in light of this new information and analysis, to reclassify this, this resource as non-contributing. And we are asking you to do the right thing for this resource, for the Old Fourth Ward Historic District, and for the community at large that will benefit from this example. Thank you for your consideration. I have a question. Um, when you purchase the property, did you have a contractor go through the property with you? No, I did not. Commissioners, any other questions for the applicant? Hmm. Robert, I, w I would say that I 
I did know a lot of contractors at the point at that point, and people like individuals uh, that had a particular uh, expertise, like Bill Yamowski, like others, did walk through it with me. But uh, at that point, I did not hire a builders to 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 do the project. I did it myself. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? Um, thank you for the very thorough report. I'm, this is really informative. Thank you. All right, and then we move on to the public hearing. Uh, so are there members of the public who would like to speak on this agenda item? And again, I will remind everyone to sign in, state your name for the record, and be sure to limit your comments to three minutes, unlike Doug, who got to speak as long as he wanted to, and I think may, probably made a new record for HCC. Uh, public commentary is limited to three minutes, um, so don't, don't make me pull out the timer. You may have to pull out the <laughs> My name is uh, Jeff Crockett, and I'm the communication officer of the O Fourth Ward Association. Uh, and I just got to say, that was one heck of an impressive performance. I've never seen anything quite like that. And it shows the dedication that Doug has towards this project. But I'm here tonight because uh, Norm and Eileen Tyler, Tyler wrote a letter to you uh, that I would like to read because they cannot be here tonight. And this letter. Uh, expresses uh, is consistent with the position of the Old Fourth Ward Association. Dear Commissioners and Ms. Thatcher, we support the petitioner's application to change the status of this building at 530, 532 North Division Street from a contributing to a non-contributing resource in the Old Fourth Ward Historic District. We have read all of the material provided by both the petitioner and staff and expect that a decision will be reached in your meeting on June the 13th. We understand that the property in question is deemed a contributing resource in the Old Fourth Ward Historic District. We also understand that its status was changed from complementary to contributing when Chapter 103 was updated in 2008. Although this resource met the obvious criteria of being on site during the period of significance established for the Old Fourth Ward, no in-depth examination was conducted nor was it required to confirm its structural or historic integrity. The resource has little that contributes to the overall description of the Old Fourth Ward Historic District. Its architectural style is undefined or vernacular. It has no outstanding architectural features. It has no known association with local historic district people or uses other than having been built before 1931. It has also been significantly altered. Bump out with shed roof over the front entry, bump out with hip roof on the south side, vinyl siding over asphalt over wood clabbered non-original windows and those changes further distract, uh, detract from any historic integrity it may have had in 1931. Recent inspections have uncovered severe structural weaknesses and deficiencies that further warrant a reevaluation of the integrity of the property. Poor quality materials, inadequate capacity of rafter, rafters and floor joists, improper bracing and shoring the attic, and scabbed together floor joists would be difficult, if not impossible, to repair without total construction. These conditions, when considered altogether, support HTC action to change the status of 530-532 North Division Street from contributing to non-contributing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Any other members of the public? Remember to state your name and sign in. Good evening, my name is Chris Crockett and I'm president of the Old Fourth Ward Association. Uh, several months ago we met with Doug, Doug uh, about, this, about his plans for this building and we were very impressed with uh, the complexity and the sincerity uh, with which he uh, was approach, approaching this renovation. But I'm really blown away today hearing how thorough he was in researching every aspect of this building as a contributing structure in the old fourth ward. I see myself as an ardent pre preservationist, very proud of our award-winning historic house and a true believer that the greenest building is the one that's already there. And that's why I want to save this building not necessarily as it is, but as it can be. And I think that he has a good plan for what it can be. Uh, 
I think that Doug has given a, a very compelling set of arguments about why the status of this building deserves consideration and change. And I don't take that lightly because we don't want to see any kind of precedent set whereby anyone can come in and change anything in the old Fourth Ward Historic District. We are very proud of the very motley assemblage of buildings we have in our near downtown neighborhood. We love that we have such a wide variety of buildings, ranging from commercial to apartment buildings to houses that have been made into apartments to single family houses. We've got it all and we love that variety. But tonight might be the time to consider adding a green building. Although we believe our 19th century house is very green and we believe that all the 19th century houses in the neighborhood are really green. But this is a special circumstance. Now a few years ago, uh, there was a situation on Kingsley Street where uh, Queen Anne, a late Queen Anne, had been neglected for years. There was a hole in the roof, there was water everywhere, and some developers came in, they wanted to buy it and tear it down and rebuild a duplicate. And I strongly argued against that. Yeah, they'd have to replace some rotted wood, but, uh, and they'd have to redo the roof and redo the floors and the plumbing and all of that, but the house had architectural integrity and structural integrity. It had always been on the same property, and the HDC upheld our opinion in the old Fourth Ward, and that house was saved and repaired, and it's there today. And that's what we want to see whenever it is possible but perhaps this time it's not possible and there has to be a change. And we think there is no better person to make this change and to do it in the direction of a green building for these times. And we hope, we know that you will take this seriously and we do too. And the old Fourth Ward Board has all discussed this. We've discussed this uh, in person at a, at a meeting, but also via emails. And we are supporting Doug Selby. And this was, you know, it's been a long and drawn out dis discussion. So we hope that you take into consideration his many, many compelling arguments for the kinds of changes that he's proposing. Thank great. you. Great, thank you. Anyone else, members of the public? Don't forget to state your name for the record and sign in. My name is Ray Jetter, and I'm Vice President of the Old Fourth Ward Association. I'm also the Chair of the Downtown Area Citizens Advisory Council, which is another group that is very much committed to historic preservation. But I also want to say that I, along with, well, first of all, that the full board of the Old Fourth Ward Association, all of us, voted to support this appeal to change the nature of this particular piece of property. We all agreed on that. But I will say this also is there are four of us on that board that actually played a part in writing the old Fourth Ward Association statement for the Preserve the Neighborhood and also the Ann Street Historic Block. And we worked for years. Susan, Susan Weinberg, of course, was a part of that. So was Louisa Piper, who has now passed away. We went thoroughly over every piece of property within that area. And I'll tell you quite frankly, when we got to this particular piece of property, the reason why we put it on the list, really, of things that had some kind of significance was that it was next door to the Cornwell House, one of the most significant historic structures in Ann Arbor. And we feared, given the nature of historic preservation in the neighborhood at that point, that that particular property would be torn down and we would have no control over what would happen on the site. Preserving it, at least in the sense of it having some significance, it had significance because it was organized in a way in which it, at that particular point, was waiting for Doug Selby. And we were waiting for Doug Selby. He bought the property and immediately began fixing it up, trying to hold it together, until now, when he's reached the point, actually, where he's going to restore it again to a very fine building within the area that will fit very well into the, uh, the significant 
a historic district, the Old Fourth Ward. I think we need to keep that in mind with regard to the nature of this particular property. He's creating something, or plans to create something, that's going to fit very well into our neighborhood. We're not losing anything at all. There's nothing contributing about that building except for the fact that it did save that piece of property long enough for Doug Selby to come along. And I sat, I sat here just thrilled with regard to the nature of the information that he provided you with regard to the reasons why we should, in this particular case, allow for a change and make this no longer into a contributing factor within the neighborhood. If you want to make that uh, afterward when he gets done and make it contributing, we'd be very glad to, glad to see that too. But at this point, what we need to do is pass this change and guarantee that there isn't, that building is not going to be torn down and we're going to have something here that, on that street which will fit much better into the old Fourth Ward uh, historic district. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Don't forget to state your name and sign it. Good evening. I'm Jan Culbertson, FAIA, and I've been practicing architecture in Ann Arbor nearly 40 years. Um, and uh, when I first uh, talked with Doug about this project, um, he said, yeah, I've done some research, and he kind of forwarded me this, um, I don't know, <laughs> it's a tomb, right, of, of of information and I really did go through it and I learned an awful lot because um, I haven't practiced his, uh, historic preservation um, although I was involved a little bit in the Earl building um, early on and I'm just really impressed with one how um, thorough and committed Doug is um, I think he has a lot of integrity um, and the way that he's brought together and really sought out the expertise of people within Ann Arbor and within the neighborhood and the Old Fourth Ward um, itself. I think that says a lot about the grassroots and the care um, and professionalism that he approaches projects with. Um, I'm also um, the chair of the Ann Arbor 2030 um, district and I want to say that um, we just completed our our, our first sort of um, performance reports on, on buildings in Ann Arbor. And even though uh, Doug's office is not in um, the district, uh, which is the boundary of Ann Arbor, his, um, the work that he's done on his office building uh, to bring it to um, a status of, of net zero is a star. And he was able to really show how something can be done with an older building and gave a lot of, of, of the other building um, owners ideas and hope um, for how you can do that with an older structure. And I'm really excited that this, his proposal for this building um, is truly transformational. And I think it will be um, a great, uh, it will show leadership, it will show know-how, it will um, truly be a contributing structure. So thank you. All right, thank you. Any other members of the public? Oh. All right. Um, let's see, I'll now close the public hearing portion of the application and the applicant please please be seated good job uh, any commissioners like to make a motion do we make, we make a motion right same process mm -hmm. all right and that's in the packet any commissioners want to make a motion just so we can find it uh, I will all right Commissioner Hall I move that the property at 530-532 uh, North Division Street in the Old Fourth Ward Historic District be designated as a non-contributing resource based on field study, previous surveys, historic documentation, and information provided by the owner. Because it does not meet the Se Secretary of Interior Standards, sorry, National Register Criteria. Seconded by Commissioner White. All right, is there a discussion on the motion? There's gotta be. <laughs> Anyone else want to go first? Down sets the tone. Usually. <laughs> For the old fourth floor, uh, they support this. I mean, the people have spoken. They're the ones that represent the old fourth floor. And uh, 
I guess I support this project. Great. Anyone else? All right, um, I was going to, do you want to? Oh, just, uh, go for it. short and sweet. Uh, just, there were all the presentations made this evening were very compelling and very thorough. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, the, I was looking for the, like the three items, the, the definition of contributing resource and, uh, you know, it had to meet all three of those items, which were, uh, let's see, present during the period of significance, relates directly to the documented significance and possesses historic integrity. Uh, the entire time this project uh, has been presented to us to consider, it's really that last item that I've struggled with. And I think given this new material that's been presented, um, I feel like I've come to terms with that and, and uh, am in support of the change. Great. So. Any other comments? I'll let you go and then All right. if I have anything to add. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say the, the letter from the Tylers, I, I feel is almost like an executive summary of, of what Doug painstakingly put together for 17 pages, but I know is probably many thousands of hours. Um, and uh, particularly in the context of new information, you know, I think as preservationists, uh, we understand some of the criteria that gets evaluated, but um, sometimes it's important to, to relook at some of that information. And this was a key point of bringing up the, the aspect, seven aspects of integrity and really highlighting for us um, each of those and how they, they pertained. Um, so there was also uh, a mentioning uh, by Ray Detter that kind of, kind of brought up the context of the time of, of you know, when these resources were becoming, um, you know, kind of the history of the, the um, historic districts themselves and the context of the necessity to ensure that these properties were all being saved. So there was much more of a, of a historic nature of we got to get this saved and as much as we can in the area saved. Um, so when evaluating a district, it was just like, okay, let's get the district saved. That's the number I'm priority. So I can see in that context how things definitively are changing over time where we're trying to qualify and classify the districts and each contributing structure within a bit district a little bit differently now. We're trying to evaluate them uh, for their integrity. Um, and I think uh, um, Clearly, your, your presentation does that. So I'm certainly in favor of, that, of the change in classification. Any other comments? Um, well, yeah, I'll Go ahead. put in mine. Um, OK, so the uh, I just want to state, uh, in terms of precedent setting and that kind of thing, um, I think there, I mean, we're clearly just talking about this property right here, that's always the case. Um, I think there is a way to probably move to historic buildings in the 1930s, join them together in some way that is preserving the, his, the, the historic context and the historic integrity of the new, you know, whatever, it'll be a new context obviously, but it's still in the 30s, so, the context would be pres preserved somehow. And if there was integrity there, then the integrity could presumably also be preserved. Um, so I think that that is possible. Um, I don't think that is what happened in the case of this particular property where um, it, seems, uh, it seems clear now after digging into uh, the details and getting more information um, from the applicant that um, it seems like the, the historic context is gone and um, whether or not there was any historic integrity, um, there's none present right now enough for me to, to say that it you know, achieves the bar of historic integrity. So um, for those two reasons, I support this as well. Yeah, I mean, when this initially came up, I kept trying to think, well, there's a lot not there anymore, but we should go through the right process to make sure we're looking at this. I'm really glad we did take the time to look at this um, and, and make sure we're making the right steps. 
uh, towards all this, but you know, Commissioner Rockland, you, you mentioned you know that there is a way to kind of hit the aspects of integrity through design, uh, but clearly here we're, we're missing out on the materials, workmanship, feeling, and association that have been kind of stripped from the whole process. All right, any others? I can also just add a couple of things. Um, you know, we Doug came here several times and we asked him to go do the research and he, he delivered big time. And it just, it's impressive uh, what you pulled together and how you walked us through this. Um, I just really appreciate that. I appreciate Ray uh, going through and kind of giving us a context of the time, like what went into that decision. That's helpful. Um, and then even though we're not dealing with this at all, like Jan and Matt talking about what's going on, like that's the future. Like it's yeah. the future and it's mm -hmm. important. Yeah, so. it is. Anyway, uh, I support, all right. of course. All right. Any other discussion? Ready to vote? All right, let's vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion carries. Your application has been approved, and you will receive written notification from staff. Uh, please note that you must apply for any required permits from the city before beginning your project. I don't remember seeing it before. Well, it's still in, just in, just in our packet. They're in there anyway. Right. It's, it's a really Moving good on. Yeah. All right, moving on. Um, oh, we're still not. We're not we'll ask that as you exit, we're still trying to finish the meeting. So as you exit, please try and be a little quiet and maybe go around the corner and talk. We want to get this over with too. No. Um, that was new business. We're moving on to the approval of minutes. We have some minutes in front of us from May 9th, 2019. last month so it's all fresh in your head mm. I just want to say thank you to everybody <laughs> thanks Doug thanks Doug, thanks, Doug. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I'm not really seeing anything. Yeah. Mm. Feels like it was so long ago. It Small. does feel long ago. Right? But Is <laughs> it? it was still snowing. No, <laughs> it was in May. No, I think it's fine. All right. Um, do I have to? Hearing and seeing no objection, the minutes are approved. Yep. Yeah. As presented. Uh, all right, now we're moving on to reports from commissioners. Mm. Any reports? Commissioners have any reports to present? Uh, just the, I think this week Cobblestone Farm was having some porch repair work done by the city. So I haven't seen it. I wasn't able to go to the meeting on Monday, but we got an email. So. Good. Yeah. Good. If it ever looks to you like it's work that should require a certificate of appropriateness <laughs> from staff or the commission, would you let me know? Yeah, okay. <laughs> That'd be great, thanks. Yeah, is there, how much communication is there? I didn't know they on, do it anymore, Within the, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Nice job. That would be great. <laughs> you could act as that liaison. All right. And I may mention it to Park staff as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, well I'll send, it, is it George or is it Parks? Uh, well, I got the, the email from yeah. Jessica. Okay, I'll talk so to Jessica. Parks. I'll talk yeah. to Jessica. Yeah. It's a new pressure treated porch or <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Are there any other reports yeah, from commissioners? Yes, I went to the Michigan Historic uh, Conference in the Hall oh, of Michigan. Very nice. It was uh, attended quite well, learned a lot. And one of the things that may come back and we we probably need to write a some type of resolution. That is the 20% uh, tax credit. It's now in, uh, it's passed the, the House of Representatives, but it hasn't passed the, uh, the Senate. And we probably should have something to send to all of our legislators in the 
Yeah. yeah. I feel like we have one from seven years ago. Do we? Right. Yeah, but no, no like just the we can bring it well, we yeah. Just put a new date on it. Send that baby out. Change the date? Yes. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I believe that. I mean, but we need no. to support that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jill, I think uh, Ellen Ramsberg wrote it. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. I can dust that off. Dust that <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. We can retool that. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, all right, any other reports? All right, we're on to assignments. Uh, the review committee is Monday, July 8th, 5 p.m. I will not be at the review committee or the regular meeting that week. No, John and July. So Evan's moving out. Yeah, that's great news. <laughs> uh, this is the 8th? July 8th. Dave, Bob, Jess, got any volunteers for July 8 at 5 o'clock? Um, possibly. I got one maybe. I'm a maybe. I got two maybes. <laughs> yeah. Just I'll need to check with the home. This is late. I, I mean, no, I, well, I, I, I can see. I, I guess you can put me no, as a maybe. I can try to. My uh, mother-in-law is 95. And I've been going back and forth to Cleveland County. Uh, and so we don't know when it's what day. What's gonna happen and so yeah. I'm not flexible yeah. like I usually am. I'm gonna put down Jess and Dave as maybes. Sounds like <laughs> and uh, hopefully I'll remember before the day of to confirm that with you both. Well yeah. Maybe, maybe before yeah. I put it I in Jess. I can ask Anna yeah. also. What's that? I won't be a cobblestone farmer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's true. I mean, that's true. Pick your poison. <laughs> we come first. Get your priorities straight. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm that's just a liaison. <laughs> All right. Uh, reports from staff. Uh, staff activities report. There's a couple interesting things on here. One is um, 235 Murray, Vicki Honeyman is has um, it says convert garden shed into hair cutting shop. That's what she's doing. The work was actually to add a window and replace a door on a non-contributing structure. Uh, she has a sort of a shed garage. It's not, it was never a garage, I don't think. It was always a big shed. Um, so a little bit of modification to that, nothing that's visible. And then the one below that, 072, is replica of a historic front door in the Zeta Phyro Sigma house. 220 North Ingalls, they have a, a, a cool historic door that's original on the inside, and the outside is just plywood with a little bit of molding glued or nailed on, like to pretend to have panels. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's like two face. It's, <laughs> it's so they just cool on one side and not on the other. Face. So it, it's deteriorated. Um, I think they've got water trapped in between the two, mm. and so they are having a new solid oak replica made wow. of it. Yeah. Good. Yeah, which is very cool. Um, the, there's a replaced 10 windows and backup house with all those. That was a uh, number 78. Yeah, that was on a sorority. They were already vinyl. They were vinyl. They were vinyl. vinyl. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Eight AC units behind building. <laughs> City of Ann Arbor, Broadway Street. Yep, that's uh, that little three or four building housing complex most of the way up the hill on the riverside. Yeah. Um, it's the the rear building, which you can't even, you, you know, you, you can't see these from anywhere. Um, they are adding AC to that building for the first time. Okay. They're also going to come in eventually with solar panels on the roof of one of those buildings, mm -hmm. but they haven't determined which one yet, so I've asked them to talk to me before they finalize that. So we've already passed our, our retreat topics. Um, but a good retreat topic might be the impacts of um, adding air conditioning to existing buildings and uh, how it changes the summer dew point and could deteriorate um, historic resources. If you have vinyl wallpaper or something? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, vinyl wallpaper is bad both summer and winter conditions. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just trying to. Yeah. But particularly yeah, during the summer with. Air conditioning, it'll it'll break apart some brick problems. You know, stuff like that. I think is kind of 
useful for us to know. And mm -hmm. I don't know how to apply it to some standard because I'm sure it's not in there. Is that something you could present on or that we yeah. need to bring somebody in on? I can, I can present. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Do you have any other sort of related modern technology versus old houses oh, like the topics that you could put together and make a little 20-minute yeah, thing? I could probably try to okay. pick some other ones up as time goes along. I mean, the retreat's not for another year, so I got time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm shooting for January or February next oh, yeah. year. I'll mm -hmm. keep a log of things, you know, as we go along. I'm like, oh, we should get that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, we're on L, concerns of commission. Any concerns? No. Uh, communications, various communications, any communications? There's one letter, newsletter from Kemp House in oh, your yeah. packet. Um, I, I stuck it in the, the folder to present to you, and Mia kindly made photocopies of it for you. Mm, I don't think I got uh, yes. yep. Oh, no. Nah. Nope. Okay. Because that. It was an extra. It was, it was with the Tyler's letter. Yep. I didn't get the Tyler's yep. letter. Oh, okay. There you go. It's in here somewhere. <laughs> From Ed Rice. There it is. Hmm. Any other communications? I'm not looking at the Gazette. I don't know if I picked up yours. That's stuff about the piano. Yeah, I picked up yours. No, I haven't. Oh. No. All right. All right. Uh, and other communications? All right, then we'll adjourn. So n there will be no further business. And without objection, I adjourn the. I will. Jill, do we have to vote for June the. June 13th. Do I need to no. adjourn or wait? Yeah. Elect or whatever. Oh, the elections. Oh. I would propose that we postpone that so that. Uh, Anna. Can Anna. <laughs> can't be in attendance. I won't be there. All right. But uh, I know. But so at least she'll be there. <laughs> We typically have a nominating committee. Would anyone like to be the nominating committee to sure. replace Max? All right. Bob's going to serve as the nominating committee. He will give us a report at the July meeting Perfect. and make a recommendation and hopefully have talked to the person that you're recommending in advance. Okay. Once this is adjourned and we're off the air. <laughs> he said to the camera. Yes, I said to the camera. <laughs> All right. All right, now adjournment. Good. There. Thank you, Evan. Being anything else? Any other communications or issues? No. We're forgetting. All right, now there being no further business, and without objection, I will adjourn the June 13th, 2009 Ann Arbor Historic District Commission meeting.